Hey guys, we are back tonight with a, another commentary for you guys. This one's going to be for Resident Evil 2 for the PlayStation 1. This is not going to be the standard commentaries that I typically do. I'm going to be answering a lot of questions and then I'm going to be outlining the, uh, the future of the channel and stuff because I've got a lot of stuff going on. So we are going to go ahead, talk shop for a while, and then we're going to go ahead and get on with the commentary and stuff. So I have been asked a few times via mail why I talk strange. And it's not something that I talk about too much. I really don't like to talk about my health or things that have happened to me in general. But the reason why I talk very strangely is because I suffer from a condition called aphasia. And what it does, I'm in the uh, beginning stages of it, thank God. But what it does is it impacts how your brain puts together speech. And it also impacts how you talk and stuff. So like a standard human being would be like, okay, you know, I want to play Resident Evil. And then sometimes my brain says, oh, I want to play Resident Evil. But sometimes when I go to open my mouth, um, it goes, oh, I were re So my, with my commentaries and stuff, um, I do have language issues with them. The thing that is causing my aphasia is the same thing that took my sight, believe it or not. So um, both of them kind of go hand in hand. So both of them, uh, one of them is eye damage and then the other one is uh, brain damage from concussive force from an IED. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to be outlining the, uh, well, what's going on with the channel for now. So I enjoy working on YouTube. The date that this is being recorded on is September 7th. And basically what's going on is whenever I make these videos, I do a bunch of them in advance. I set them up to be uploaded like weeks in advance. That way they can just release on that Friday at 9 a.m. So what we have going on is by the time this commentary releases, it is going to be for the ass end of October. We're going to be doing the first and second weeks of October with Resident Evil 3 and its commentary. Uh, the third week for October is going to be Resident Evil 2. And then the fourth week is going to be the Resident Evil 2 with commentary. And then um, an explanation for the future of the channel. So I'm a rather private individual most of the time. I don't really talk about my life or anything. And when I do, it's with a real select group of people and stuff. It's not a uh, common thing for me to just kind of blurb it out and stuff, but I want to provide an answer in case I don't upload for a while. So I, I have a family. I take care of my mom and my dad. Both of them are very old. My, um, my dad is like midway through his 70s. Uh, my mom is creeping up on her 60s. She's actually considerably younger than my dad. My dad is in full, uh, fully uh, good health, I think, aside from onset of Alzheimer's and stuff. And my mom has, uh, she's been going through a steady decline for a really long time now. So, um, we have been having issues with my mom for like a really long time. Um, we have been sending her down for testing and stuff, and we don't know what's going on but they largely suspect that it is uh, some form of cancer. What this means is that if it is a cancer diagnosis, that um, after October, videos are going to stop. It's not whether or not I... Um, it's not whether or not I enjoy doing the videos. Um, it's not how much work I have to put into uh, doing one of these videos. It is purely the simplistic fact of if she gets diagnosed with anything, I'm going to be putting YouTube on hold for the express purpose of taking care of her. Now, anybody that knows me knows that I don't really generally um, get along 
with my family too well. We come from very different walks of life, but I do still want to take care of them in their old age, is really what it boils down to. So if my mom gets a cancer diagnosis, all the videos are going to be lined up until the ass end of October. I may have a couple more videos planned, I don't know yet. I know a couple of uh, my friends have been wanting me to do kids games so their kids have something to watch during the day. But the point that I'm making here is that if she does wind up getting a diagnosis for this, the channel will be put on indefinitely. All of the content will still be here. All 1,000 some odd videos, the long plays are still going to be here. All of the uh, questionable clips that I've made are going to be here. The channel is still going to exist. I will not be contributing to it until life settles down. Um, I don't expect to come back to YouTube if she gets diagnosed with any form of cancer and then she winds up passing away. It's going to take me a really long time to actually recover from that. So a couple of... Um, this pressure has been weighing on me for quite some time. It's been reflecting in my runs. It's been reflecting in um, how I play games in general because it's a very stressful thing for me. So we have no real, um, well my parents have no plans, essentially. They, they don't have anything set up or anything like that. So I'm going to have to carry it for a long time because both of my brothers are out of the picture. That's its own story. It's not something I'm going to talk about on the channel. So, if stuff like this bothers you and you want me to just continue uploading and, you know, you're angry that, you know, I'm not going to be uploading if I get a bad diagnosis, um, feel free to unsubscribe. It's perfectly fine. I don't feel bad about it. You know, it's just with YouTube, it takes up a lot of my time, like all of my spare time, essentially. Um... People don't really realize, I don't think, how long it takes to push a video out. So, I, I'm i really good at consolidating my time and stuff. The only reason I'm able to do weekly releases of games and stuff is simply because I can take a weekend when I'm not working on other things, and I can bang out a couple of runs. That's one of the reasons why I actually go and pick games that are actually kind of on the shorter side. That's why you don't see me doing 40-hour runs of, like, Assassin's Creed and stuff. So it's not something that, realistically, I would be able to do. So a lot of these short games, I'm able to bang them out over the course of a weekend. Like, over the course of three days, I can start on Friday and on Sunday. I can literally go complete recording for a game and then turn around and do the commentary for it the very same evening. The setup that I use, I don't have a professional setup by any means. Um, so a lot of people were asking, you know, what do you use, Rain? You know, what is your equipment? To play the games, because a lot of my retro consoles are in a state of disrepair, they're incredibly expensive to repair and replace, um, so I kind of stopped doing it a while back. And a lot of the games that are uh, being ran, I used to own until Disc Rot set in. So, a lot of these titles are literally backups of games that I've had. And then I'm running them quite literally on Open Emu. And I actually like Open Emu because it allows me to have all of my titles in one spot. You know, so I can sit down and be like, oh, okay, you know, all of my stuff is right here. Everything is recorded off of a 2012 Mac Mini quad-core i7. And it um, it handles it very well. I mean, it, it runs fucking hot as hell. Oh, Jesus Christ, this thing. But that's pretty much what I do all my recording on. You know, like, I go, I set up screen capture with audio capture on the side since Apple doesn't like people recording audio natively. I, I have a workaround for that. So... To do commentaries, it's actually really, really funny. It, it's funny and it's kind of lazy. So I'm a photographer, a, um, a blind one. I do photography on the side. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. You know, I just I enjoy it either way. And to do a lot of my astrophotos, I have a tripod. 
so a while back I um, I take all of my photos with um, a Pixel phone most of the time. I started on a Pixel 2, migrated over to a Pixel 6. So what had happened essentially was um, I went ahead and I've been using my phone to record commentary. I take the tripod that I take my photos on. I have an attachment that screws into the top. I slide my phone into the attachment and then I use the recording app on my operating system. I, I run Android to record my voice. From there, I download the recording and I apply it to the video. So a lot of the time when I'm doing commentary, I'm literally sitting here watching the game and I am just recording my thoughts while I have a phone quite literally uh, sitting next to my head. It's, it's probably about a foot and a half, two feet away. So that's how I do my commentary. Once the commentary is downloaded, I line it up with the video and from there I try to adjust the volume even though uh, YouTube is kind of screwed up at the moment. And so what winds up happening is I go, I line up the volume to the best of my ability, I click render, and then it takes, uh, depending on how long the footage is, it normally takes a couple hours to render. I have a tendency, um, I was asked why I don't record in 1080p. Oh, there's a couple reasons. Um, first off, my screen, so everything that I work on is uh, done on a 55 inch TV. The Mac Mini has an HDMI on it, I just plug it into the TV. Now with everything, with my eyesight being super bad, everything in 1080p looks too small. So basically what happens is I went into the settings and I went ahead, moved it over to 720p to make things bigger, and then I made um, individual icons bigger and everything else. I just I tried to make everything as big as possible to accommodate my disability and stuff. So the reason why all the videos are in 720p is because I literally, um, when I click screen record, it records the resolution that you're currently using. So it records at 720p at 60 frames because that's what my display is set up for. Now, could I go and record in 1080p 60 frames? Absolutely, but I choose not to because one, I wouldn't be able to uh, see it very well. Uh, controls would be a nightmare. Turning off the uh, recording would be a nightmare because the button's already really, really small. I leave it in 720p mainly because of the uh, the market. I wound up going and doing some checks a while back, and I thought the majority of people on YouTube were literally on a desktop computer going and watching videos or like on a TV or something. It turns out that like 86% of YouTube's traffic is on a mobile phone. Well, from mobile phones. So the best resolution to watch a video on a mobile phone, especially like for data and everything else, is 720p. So I have a tendency to keep this in mind because that is the that is where the bulk of YouTube's user base is at. So, you know, I just I recorded at 720p 60 frames. It keeps the gameplay looking buttery. I like footage to look really, really smooth. You know, like I, I just, I like 60 frames in general. I, I like to have a certain presentation when I go and I do these videos. I realize that it's not the best gameplay, but I try to have the best production value that I can with the equipment that I have. I have to cut quite a few corners. I'm not recording my voice natively on the Mac. I'm doing it over a phone, then tweaking the sound file over, but it gets done. And it's not bad for what it is. So that's pretty much how my entire setup is done. Um, depending on where I go in life, I would like to invest in a better setup. I've looked at it for quite some time now. But with life being really chaotic and everything being really tense, I'm kind of afraid to breathe a little. So I just, like, I want to invest in it, but with everything, you know, with all of us not really knowing what's going on, with me not knowing if I'm going to be able to continue doing YouTube as a hobby, I just don't really want to invest in anything. So I, I feel that it's fair. Um, at the end of the day, YouTube is something that I do for fun. 
I have had many times, or many times, I've had many options to monetize and stuff. But I didn't really want that. Like, I didn't want to sit there and be like, oh, okay, let's go ahead and monetize and then throw ads up. And I've had a couple of people that have wanted to sponsor my videos, and I just didn't want that. Like, I basically wanted people to be able to go come up to these uh, videos, watch them ad-free, no ad in the video, no ad, you know, coming up before the video. You know, I just, I wanted people to come up and be able to watch these without having to worry about some intrusive advert popping out of the woodwork. And so really early on with this channel, when I decided I was going to do LPs, I said to myself, okay, we're never going to monetize this. This is always going to be a hobby. You know, um, it's not a source for work. I don't even think this is something that I could use to sustain myself like at all. I don't think it's something that I would be able to turn into something that's sustainable purely for the reason of, I don't think it boils down to whether or not the gameplay is good or bad. I think that it boils down to as soon as I choose to monetize, it goes from being fun to being work. And it adds a lot of pressure to me. So I really, I just, I made the choice early on to just never do it. There is no link to my PayPal, there, there is no Patreon, there, there's no nothing, man. It's just me sitting here posting these videos because I like it, because I want to share it with people. And a lot of people really didn't understand that, I don't think, personally. You know, they were like, why don't you make money off of it? Not everything's here to turn a profit. You know, if I want to make money, I know how to do it. It's not hard. So, this uh, this run of Resident Evil 2 is something kind of special. It was actually unplanned. And what I mean by that is, I initially, when I was running Resident Evil 2, I was initially saying to myself, okay, we're going to go through, we're going to screw up a lot, and we're going to save regularly. It's, it's going to be like a, a very organic experience and you know that's just kind of how that is but i found that as i was going and doing runs for resident evil 2 a lot of knowledge from like 15 almost uh 20 years ago kind of came flooding back because i used to speed run this game a fair bit i wasn't the best at it but i enjoyed doing it so the more runs of resident evil 2 i put in the easier and easier it got and I still get bit, I got moments where I get my ass whipped and stuff, but I feel that this run is actually kind of something special because my um, my vision is so heavily degraded that I didn't think I'd be able to pull off a run where I didn't save and, you know, I didn't die. I mean, I still take plenty of damage, I kill plenty of zombies, plenty of dogs, lots of monsters, but this run is kind of something special because it literally has no saves. It has no saves, no save states, just nothing. You know, I did it all in a single take, taking lots of damage, but also going and not dying on top of it. So that's why this um, this LP is actually pretty damn special, because I didn't think I'd be able to do it. So what had happened was I was going and doing a lot of these runs, and old habits kind of break in again i guess you know like no matter how old the habit is i feel that it kind of goes and it breaks in and you know you're kind of sitting there and it, it's quite literally the stereotypical phrase of oh it's all coming back to me now so that literally was the case with resident evil 2 it's kind of daunting you know when you first start i had literally started and i was um saying to myself christ i barely remember most of the police station and stuff and so the more that I had played around with it, the more I had started to formulate uh, routes and stuff. So I kind of, I broke back in and stuff, and while I'm nowhere near my speed run time, I was able to do this entire game in like 2 hours and 30 seconds. I was pretty happy with that. I can't really complain. You know, it was like ballpark what we did with Resident Evil 3, you know. So Resident Evil 2... It was it was quite a challenge, I think. Uh, some bosses I really struggled with because I wasn't able to track where they were going correctly. Um, there's a specific instance where I get my ass caned through the floor by a bunch of dogs because I wasn't able to see them correctly. 
overall I felt that Resident Evil 2 was a very easy experience compared to Resident Evil 3 because a lot of these maps actually have uh, really good amounts of high contrast to them. You know, a lot of the contrast actually has a tendency to offset. And I was like, you know what, yeah, I can do this. It's a little bit daunting, you know, I'm gonna have to put in the time and stuff, but um, I can do this. And so I just, I kept trying and stuff. Um, there are some areas where I get turned around and then um, since Resident Evil 2 is kind of an expansive game and I'm thinking um, pretty far ahead in terms of the run and stuff, there are some instances where I have to go back and because I forgot like four or five items, you know, that I was supposed to have with me. And But overall, I think the run did really, really well. You know, I'm, I'm actually kind of proud of this a little bit because... I thought I was going to be saving left and right, and but the more I broke into it, the more I was like, okay, this is what this looks like, this is what that looks like. I, I really liked it, you know, it felt good. Um, initially, I was going to do a double feature. I was going to do um, Leon A and Claire B, and but the thing is, is I really don't like Claire's runs. I just, I don't really... I don't like the weapons that she gets, I just don't like how the run pans out, I just don't really care for much of anything about it. I've always enjoyed doing runs as Leon. I like his weapon upgrades and stuff, you know, just everything with Leon feels really, really nice and it feels super smooth. And But with Claire, I think I kind of struggled with it a lot, you know, so I didn't really care for her too much. Um, it had nothing to do really with, like... Her character or anything but it had like a lot to do with how the run was set up weapons things like that it was literally me nitpicking so what I decided to do is I decided to do a Leon run which is you know pretty stereotypical you know you can find lots of them on YouTube but at the same time I said to myself okay well do we really just want to do a bunch of a and B runs and then not bother to do commentary so with life circumstance being currently what they are, I decided it would be better to do commentary because if this indeed does become my last video for a long time, I at least want it to be explained to the best of my ability. So when I started playing Resident Evil, um, I played one. Uh, it was actually initially an import that my older brother had ordered and stuff and it was scary as hell i missed two entirely because it was so damn popular when it first rolled out that i literally could not get my hands on it i couldn't get my hands on a new copy a used copy i mean it was selling out so fast so freaking fast like i couldn't even keep up with it and so i missed two and i went to three now, I played 2 shortly after 3. I had managed to get a used copy from a friend of mine. He had played the hell out of it, you know, and he was looking to buy new games and stuff. And, you know, this is around the time where you could still go to um, GameStop, but back then it was known as Electronics Boutique. And you could sell off your old games and get new ones. Well, back then they wanted to give him only like 10 bucks, and I was going to give him like 30, so he just took the 30 and... That's how I started playing Resident Evil 2. It was a trip, uh, mainly because it came on two discs, you know, that was, uh, that was kind of a new thing back then, you know. Like, we had uh, a, lot of, a lot more games on uh, PlayStation using multiple discs and stuff compared to, like, having to be compressed all to high hell to fit on the Nintendo 64 cartridge and stuff, so... It was kind of weird because, you know, um, back then it was like, oh, well, if you want to do this particular thing, you got to plug in the extra disc, you know, open up the tray, slide it in, close the door, and you're, you're pretty much shaking with bacon. But, um, <clears throat> so I played, like I said, I played Resident Evil 2 late. It's kind of weird because I, I kind of have a tendency to look through this game uh, using rose-tinted glasses as well i mean it's a good game it is a good game it's not my favorite resident evil but it is a good game nonetheless you know so i i played it and i kind of had like an adverse reaction to it a little bit because i was used to how clean the cutscenes were with resident evil 3 and then with resident evil 2 they were very compressed and they were very, very um, grainy, for lack of a better term, because they were trying to squeeze this game onto, like, 
uh, two CD-ROMs, essentially. So I found myself, when I was going back and doing these runs and playing it, I literally thought my emulator was broken because I said, God damn, I don't remember these cutscenes looking this bad. I don't remember, you know, being this blurred. So I wound up playing it um, a couple of times, and I kind of flaked it off a little bit, you know, and I wound up selling my entire Resident Evil collection back when I had sold my first PlayStation 1 to EB Games. So, the majority of my experience for Resident Evil 2, much like 3, comes from the GameCube ports. And I had to do a little bit of research and stuff, and I forgot how good the GameCube port actually looks. The cutscenes are cleaned up, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, what is it, suffer from all the issues that the PlayStation 1 version had. It was, it was actually really nice. I mean, the PlayStation 1 version is still really, really good for the time, you know? Like, the fact that we had full-blown voice acting and, you know, decent cutscenes also with voice acting and stuff. It was kind of a big thing back then. Not a lot of games actually did it. You know, so it was kind of mind-blowing to sit there and, you know, have games that actually did it. I mean, I don't even think um, we had huge games like... Final Fantasy 7 going and eating up multiple CDs and there is literally um, no voice acting throughout any of it. <coughs> so, you know, with Resident Evil it was actually kind of cool that they had voice acting and, you know, the cutscenes were really nice for the time and, but looking back on the game, you know, sitting there playing it and doing this run, I'm literally sitting there looking at it and I'm just like, man, I forgot how fucking ugly some of this was. Like, Resident Evil is still fun to play, you know, like, Resi 2 is still really, really fun to play. I have a good time with it and stuff, but goddamn, I forgot how ugly some of this game is. I guess the GameCube port definitely spoiled me in that regard. So, I played the game on easy, for the obvious reason, you know, I... Didn't, like, with these long plays and stuff, I don't really feel like I'm out to prove anything besides what is literally in the uh, title line of the series. You know, just a blind gamer going and, you know, playing old games, essentially, and, you know, trying to be decent at it. But no, I didn't want to do a speed run. I didn't want to do, like, a knife run or anything. I just wanted to do a run where I went around, did all that I could collect, you know, all the weapon upgrades, read some documents, you know, just kind of sit down and have fun with it. It was really, really just kind of one of those things where I just sat down and I looked at it much like three in that regard, except with two, I wanted to take it a little bit more seriously in terms of like going and getting bitten and stuff, because I find that with Resident Evil 2, they're a little bit more stingy with ammo. I mean, towards the end of the game, I have tons of it. But it's not like 3 where you're like swimming in so much of it or with 3 where you can make a ton of magnum rounds and then go and, uh, what is it, just go and dominate the last third of the game with it. So with Resident Evil 2 you have to think a little bit more, you have to be a little bit more thoughtful. The, um, the crowds of zombies in 2 are fucking massive compared to 3. That's one thing I definitely did forget about the game. I remember sitting there playing it and, you know, it's kind of weird because I played I played it a lot, essentially, but I kind of forgot as the years went by. You know, like you haven't played something in so long that eventually you do forget about it. So I had, the last time I had touched Resident Evil 2 prior to the remake, which is so goddamn good, is um, on GameCube. Literally, my last experience with the original Resi 2 is on GameCube. And so what I had said to myself was, okay, you know, let's go ahead and play this. And, you know, I, I forgot how big the groups of zombies are. Like, there was, um, there was some times where I was going through the run and I popped up in rooms and there's five of them waiting for me. And I'm just sitting there going, oh, Jesus Christ. You know, it's it's really kind of surreal, I think. You know, when you sit there and you look at it and stuff, and you're kind of like, oh, geez. You know, I, I completely forgot about this. I also forgot that there is no aim assist in any of this damn game. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have to actually learn to get good with a gun 
essentially because with resi 3 when i was going and doing that run i was like okay i can have shitty vision and still enjoy the game because when i go and you know when i aim that aim assist is going to be uh it's gonna be uh helping me the entire time with resi 2 no such thing so I would completely forgotten no that because my memory has eroded as like the last 15, 20 up. years has gone by. And so I forgot that, you know, I'm going to have to be good with a pistol. Shotgun, not right. so much, but to be fair, it is the shotgun. Um, I forgot how sketchy a lot of the aim for Resident Evil 2 is as well. You know, like sometimes it'll look like that I'm aiming straight down the sights and I won't hit jack shit. So I kind of forgot about that. But the weird thing is, is I don't really remember these being problems with the GameCube port. It's really weird in that regard. Like, I know that the GameCube port did a lot of things differently. It had cleaned up visuals. It had uh, cleaned up movies. and But I don't remember it being as bad as this. So to literally sit down and play the original PlayStation port again after like 20 and some odd years, I'm kind of like sitting there and I'm like going, oh my god, you know, was this actually like this? And yeah, it was. After a while, you kind of, uh, you kind of accept it though, you know what I mean? You're kind of like, oh, well, you know, this was the times back then. You know, it's, um, it's rather interesting, I think. But no, uh, this video actually almost uh, didn't happen, believe it or not. It, it almost suffered the same fate as Resi 3. So, this is going to be, I guess, a series of hot takes about the community and stuff. You know, because it's, it's really weird. I find that the, um, in my opinion, I feel that the Resident Evil community is actually really, really toxic. So I had posted in a very large Discord that it caters to Resident Evil that I was going to do this blind. And people had started goal stretching it almost immediately. So the idea with all of these games is that it is a legally blind person going and playing the game and showing other people who may be blind or may be fully sighted and stuff, you know, more able-bodied, that you can actually, with enough training, you can go and continue to um, play games and play them reasonably well. So I was in the Discord, I had announced it, and instead of going and maybe getting a little bit of encouragement, it was basically kind of like a stone wall. Everybody was kind of goal stretching and saying, you know, make it a knife run. You know, uh, make it a pistol run, make it a speed run, you know, exercise some crazy amounts of skill with it. And I, I kind of thought about it. Like, I, I sat on this for, I think, like two days. And I went back some two days later, and I was like, yeah, this is not going to be a speed run, or a knife run, or a pistol run, or any kind of, you know, just high skill run. And a lot of people in the Discord had actually gotten really, uh, really upset with it. And they're like, but why? And I went ahead and I explained it. I said I was going to play the game on easy. And that I was going to do it, you know, completely blind and play it as is. And a lot of people had gotten upset because they feel, I guess, for lack of a better term, that you have to have an insane amount of skill with every run that you do of Resident Evil 2. In many ways, it's kind of become a lot like what the Doom community has become, where elitism has kind of taken it over and stuff. And so now, whenever the hell you announce you're going to do something, people actually get really, really pissed off if it's not what they feel it should be. So I had received a bunch of negative feedback about it. And I would hear often, well, why can't you do it like so-and-so? And I would commonly be compared to, a lot of the times, like um, an influencer from the community. And so I had to explain to people. I was sitting down and I said, okay, well, those people can see normally. I can't. You know, and a lot of people would get upset and they're like, well, that's no excuse. And I said, I'm not using it as a total excuse, but it does impact how I play the game. 
Now, would it be insane for me to be, like, almost completely blind, then go in and play this game with nothing but a knife or a pistol or, you know, speedrun it? Yeah, it would be insane. That, that would be some fucking crazy-ass amounts of skill that I would have. But the thing is, is that what my vision looks like a lot of the time is it's kind of smeared. I'm completely blind to my left. My right literally looks like I have um, saran wrap stretched over it, and then it's covered in a light coat of Vaseline. Everything just looks really blurred. So I, you know, like, for me, goals with this are very simple. You know, and it's literally, first and foremost, beat the game. That's kind of an obvious common sense thing. You know, just beat the game. Um, and then I have certain stretch goals, like with Resident Evil 2, it's like, you know, beat the game and then beat it without dying, without saving. And, you know, I did it and it felt good. But with my vision being as bad as it is, um, a lot of speed running really kind of revolves around evasion. And with really low vision, evasion doesn't really happen too often anymore. Uh, knife runs have their own issues because with knife runs I have to correctly gauge how close an enemy is to me. And when your enemy looks like a giant blob and you go and uh, you go to swing the knife and you miss, it's because you're trying to hit the edge of that blob. So as an end result, using knives, um, speedrunning in general is kind of problematic for me. It's not whether or not I can or cannot do it, it's running into various roadblocks in the way. You know, I'm sure that I could do speed runs completely blind, you know, after doing, you know, 40 or 50 runs and having everything down to a science. But the thing is, is with these videos, I don't want, I don't want to do 40 or 50 runs. There's already people that literally all they do is speed runs and stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy that they can go and do it. You know, I'm glad that, you know, they're catering to that market. But for me, the core of these videos is literally to sit there and say, oh, okay, this is a blind trans girl sitting down, playing games, and beating them. There's not a lot of blind people I know that actually try to go and play games. Like, when they had lost their sight, because I do have other friends that are, like, blind and stuff... When they had lost their sight, um, they just gave up entirely. And when I had lost the majority of my sight, I kind of went through like this weird phase where I was like, oh man, my life is over. And I thought about it for a while, like I was in the middle of my 20s, you know, and I was sitting there thinking about it and I said, yeah, you know, I, I guess it's over. I guess I can't, you know, um, enjoy anything anymore. And so I had thought about it for like a really long time. Like I, I probably stewed in it for probably three years. And then one day I just got up and I, I was kind of just, it, it was like a weird morning for me, I think. Like I got up, I had some tea. I, I'm always drinking some form of cold tea. And I said to myself, you know, this is not the end of my life. And I had sat down. The first game that I had tried to play with low vision um, I was still adjusting to how smeared everything was, but the very first game that I had tried to beat with low vision was the first Castlevania. That shit's fucking hard for people that have normal vision, let alone somebody that barely has any vision. So, when I go and I do these games, the accomplishment is to beat the game. It's not to beat it fast, it's not to beat it on hard, it's, you know, it's just to play the game, have a good time with it, beat it, and show other people that are short-sighted or um, almost completely blind, you know, hey, you can still enjoy these, but you have to put in more effort. You know, a lot of these games aren't accessible. So, when I was sitting in the Discord and I had made this statement, everybody bitched. You know, like, everybody was sitting there whining about it, and it's really weird because I feel that the community in general is just rather toxic. You know, like, I've been kind of slowly leaving the community for a while now. I still have some people, like some friends in the community and stuff, but, um, 
largely I don't really feel like I participate too much in the community anymore because it's constantly riddled with bullshit and negativity. Now I know that I'm going to run into negative stuff wherever I go. That's fine, but I try really hard to mitigate it, I think. So I try really hard to stay away from most of the influencers that are um, in the Resident Evil community because I, I feel that they're rather toxic, especially when you start getting into like the speedrunning crowd and stuff. You know, they're, they're kind of seedy individuals, I, fe I feel. <coughs> most of them are pretty good people for the most part, but there's like a lot of them that are just like the worst. Another thing that kind of drove me away from the community a bit is um, I never really understood the overall hate for like other survival horror games like Alone in the Dark, Clock Tower, and uh, my other favorite, my other love of my life, uh, Silent Hill. So as time has gone on, a lot of the a lot of the community has just kind of eroded and stuff. I'm tired of the negativity and the bullshit that comes with it. And I think when I was announcing that I was going to be doing this run for Resident Evil 2, everything just kind of culminated together. And I just said to myself, man, I really just don't want to, you know, do this. When I had first entered the Resident Evil community, everybody was like really encouraging and information was commonly shared to help everybody because the original Resident Evil it didn't really have an easy you know the first Resident Evil was fucking hard like it was a difficult goddamn goddamn game essentially and so we had people that had mastered the game going and helping like all the new people and stuff the problem that I had with Resident Evil 1 is it was all in Japanese it was an import and so you know, my brother and his friends would help me through it because I was a lot younger than them. So that for me is what the Resident Evil community um, is that I know and love, essentially. It's kind of turned into a heavily warped kind of caricature of itself. It used to be that people would help each other all the time. Now they just kind of shit and dunk on each other all the time. And it doesn't really feel good. You know, there's also like an ongoing dialogue where um, one is viewed as a classic, two is viewed as the best, three is viewed as all right, and then Survivor is viewed as like the worst in the series. And I mean, it's pretty goddamn bad, but it's not the worst. And if you don't share those opinions, you know, people have a tendency to get angry. You know, there, there seems to be like a lot of hive mentality thinking i think you know there's there's not a lot of uh, room in the community i feel for honest discussion and stuff you know like i had blatantly pointed out i was doing the footage for resident evil survivor and i said that i was having fun with it and as soon as i had done so everybody had like started bitching about it saying oh it's like the worst game in the series how the hell are you having fun with it and I openly admit it because it merges my two favorite things, Resident Evil and Light Guns, you know. So as time has gone on, I've just kind of taken a step back from the community a little bit. I still love the games. I mean, I don't play them a super huge amount, but um, I just don't really like what the community's become. I don't like a lot of the bullshitting and the backbiting and, you know, it really just kind of hampers the experience. I kind of wish that it was the 90s again and everybody was just kind of teaching each other how to go and do these things. Um, I think the last example that I had seen was I was learning, strangely enough, how to do the, um, do the hardest difficulty for Resident Evil 2, the remake. And the last guy that I actually saw who was going and doing the um, doing the work to help others, essentially, his name is Darkness, and he's on YouTube. He does Everyman Guides for, uh, well, last time I checked, he was doing Everyman Guides for survival horror games, and I really miss stuff like that. I, I really miss when people would just kind of come together and, you know, help one another, and I don't really see that too often anymore. Now it's just a bunch of whining and bitching and asking redundant questions. And and I don't mean redundant questions like, how do you beat this boss? I mean redundant questions like, 
oh well we know that you know you can't see but why aren't you playing it on hard you know so I just I, I think about it a lot you know I, I got kind of cold feet doing uh, what is it I got cold feet doing the run for Resi 2 because I was afraid of getting like backlash from everybody essentially because it wasn't on hard it was being played on easy and you know it just it wasn't what everybody was expecting and stuff and it's kind of weird you know so I just I've I've just been kind of backing off the community a fair bit and I feel a lot better now that I've done so you know I, I figured you know I don't really need the community to enjoy the games and stuff and I feel that you know for the sake of my own mental health essentially I'm just gonna kind of be staying away from it while I do these runs and stuff and I feel that as long as I'm having fun with it that's all that really matters and as long as like whoever the hell is watching this has fun I think that's what's important to me too you know it's it's just it's a priority for me I think so it kind of sits on my mind a fair bit you know and it's kind of weird to sit here and talk about it because I know that some people are probably going to get upset, you know. They're going to get all upset because, you know, I'm having a differing opinion and they're not going to be able to handle it. And, or maybe they're going to be upset because I shot this video and some 45 minutes into it, I got my ass whooped by a bunch of dogs. You know, it, it really, I don't know. I, I just, I really, I'm trying really hard not to pay attention to it, I think. So I, I was really, um, I still am, actually. I'm very proud of this run. No saves. No saves, no death. You know, just running through and mowing down zombies and just having a really good time with it. Hell, I had somebody get pissed off because I decided I wasn't going to do B runs. I, I never really cared for the B roots in Resident Evil 2 too much. Like, I didn't even really care for Leon's B root. It didn't really... Like, it changed a little bit, but it's not something that is original enough for me to go back and do, you know, again and again and again. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the egg runs, essentially. They're a lot more fun to go and run through, and I just enjoy it more. I was surprised that I actually got as much uh, down pat as I did, you know, especially with like some of these areas like right here, there's like so much gray, I was shocked that I was able to get around that, uh, what I'm assuming is a fence, um, I was shocked that I was able to get around it as well as I did, I was shocked that I was able to do a lot of the puzzles as well, um, normally my, um, normally my older sister, well, She's not related to me, she's just a really good friend, but she normally comes in and she checks on me and she's like, hey, how you doing? And normally sometimes I'll be like, hey, you know, where am I at, essentially? Like, I have a tendency to get lost and turned around a lot. And With Resident Evil 2, I didn't really need um, too much redirecting and stuff. I was able to get up close to the game and there's a couple times where I used the map and stuff and... And that's because um, one thing I liked about Resident Evil 2, what it does with its map is, so you go and you get a key, and obviously it has like a color like green or red or pink. And what it'll do is um, when you pull up the map, all the doors that are correlated with that key, it, it has that color attached to them, which is really nice. Um, later on, I had gotten so good with the run that I was actually able to remember most of where most of the keys went, like most of the doors and stuff. But there's still like a couple of times where I literally sit back and I'm like, okay, I can't tell where the hell I'm at. I'm fucking lost. You know, like I, I had no shame in my game. Like, not at all. I was like, okay, we're going to pull up the map. And we're going to see how much of it we can see, and then we're just going to go ahead and go from there. And so it's it's actually something that I... It's uh, something that I was kind of coping with a fair bit. But hey, you know, the run got done. It's kind of funny how like I'm going through and I'm picking up all these fucking ink ribbons, and yet at this point in the game I decided I wasn't going to need them. 
It was just a, a hell of a thing, you know? Like, I learned a lot with this run and stuff. And then, like, some of my older habits were kind of kicking in, too. Especially with, like, organizing the item box. Oh, God. I was so notorious for doing that shit back on GameCube. I would literally go and I would have the item box arranged in a certain way. It was normally firepower up top, key items on the tippy top, and then on the bottom it was, like, basically shit I didn't need, like ink ribbons and... Um, and, like, healing supplies I didn't really use too much. You know, and then I'm also a notorious combiner on top of it. Like, most of the people I know, they just go and get their herbs and they toss it in the chest and combine it whenever the hell they need it. Or if they know if there's a boss coming up. And then with me, I would just be like, you know, I'm already here. Fuck it, we're gonna combine it right quick. And, you know, it's it's just really silly. Like, I still have, like, a lot of really old habits from Resident Evil 2, you know, I still go and collect all the weapon parts and, you know, especially for the pistol and it's weird because like with the pistol and stuff, so for those that don't know, when you collect the upgrade for the pistol, what it does is it puts a stock on it and then it gives it three round burst. It turns it into Matilda, essentially. And so what had happened was I know that I'm not going to use three round burst that often or really at all because it will chew through my ammo reserves so fast. One thing I noticed about it is um, it's a three round burst and you can miss, you can expect to miss at least one round, especially when the zombies transition to the animation of like hitting the ground. So I try really hard not to use three round burst unless I absolutely have to. The only time you'll see me use three round burst is if there is like a complete and utter clusterfuck of zombies that are walking towards me and I need to mow them down or at least just get them on the ground as fast as possible. The, uh, the records room is uh, one such instance where I was going through, I was circling around and getting ready to open up the door that leads to uh, zombified Marvin. And so what wound up happening is I went through that door. I forgot that I had the pistol stuck on automatic. And as an end result, what wound up happening was they were right there in my face. And I didn't want to waste a bunch of healing items. So I said to hell with it. And I just sprayed and sprayed and sprayed. But the bad thing about it was I wound up going through like 27 rounds like it was nothing. I mean, granted, everything in the room was dead. But I was just, like, going through the rounds so fast. And then this room. Oh, jeez. I caught so much hell for this room. So everybody was sitting there, and they were like, Yeah, just do a complete extermination run. There is no enemy in Resident Evil I hate quite like lizards. Especially with shit like this. Just bolting through the window and crap and cranking up for another swing. God, man. I There was two enemies that I hated in all of Resident Evil 2. The fucking dogs and the lickers. The liquors are not so bad when you have a shotgun, you know, but the dogs are just insufferable. The dogs can take just as many rounds as a standard fucking zombie can, you know, and it's it's just very obnoxious. Even if you wait for them to jump at you and pump around in their face, they'll still take a couple more rounds after that. And they're not only fast, they do a lot of damage. If there's two of them, they'll nickel and dime the holy living hell out of you. It's just really rough. Like, the whole thing with dogs in general is rough. Sometimes shots don't even connect. It was just so weird dealing with the goddamn dogs in this run. Like, I, I hated it so much. I was like, oh god, we're doing this. So, with this run, what I tried to do was... I wanted to co collect all the items that I could. So, like, whenever I get, like, a small key, you know... It's not uncommon for me to go back and use it on whatever the hell, you know, it was supposed to be used on. And then I also take time out to shut down the shutters. Well, not shut down the shutters, but, like, activate them and stuff. So I can shut down all the zombies from fucking going through the windows. And Yeah, I just, I, I really enjoy playing around on this particular environment that they actually give you. You know, for Resident Evil 2, like, the location is very memorable. I like how a lot of the precinct literally has, like, that uh, 1990s Tokyo design philosophy. I, I really like that. It, it feels really fresh. 
all these years later it still feels really fresh and I always felt that that was a really good hallmark for this game you know it's like when they say that this crap took place in like 1998 you know they're being serious with it you know even the design references that fact you know so it just it feels really really good to run through it and stuff and ah here's that room I was talking about yeah just hose 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 dude bites me and I'm just like oh god damn it and you just keep hosing them and stuff. It was one of the few instances where I was actually really happy that I had Matilda on me. Normally I have a tendency in the uh, in the menu for the gun, I have a tendency to turn off automatic. And then after a while what had happened was I was like, okay, well, I have to hold it down to hose out all three rounds. So I might as well just leave it on fully automatic and um, just learn to tap X essentially so with a lot of these notes I don't know if anybody's actually reading them but I still as an end result like as a consequence of that I still try to pace through the notes kind of slowly in case somebody wants to read it so in the back of my mind what I have a tendency to do is with the notes um, I count to five on medium sized pages, seven on large ones, and then I just click the uh, click the note over essentially. I don't actually read it, you know, well I used to but I don't anymore, especially when doing runs like this and stuff. I've already read it once, I don't need to keep reading it every single time I run across it. But um, yeah, like I try to go and I try to leave the notes up a little bit as like a courtesy to the player and stuff. I always felt bad for killing Marvin, strangely enough. He was just a really cool character, I think. I remember the ongoing joke back then was everybody kept calling him Will Smith because he um, he had some Fresh Prince of Bel-Air look going on for him, you know, hairdo and everything. But he was a cool character. I think it was kind of like a, a missed opportunity, I think, because I feel that they could have done some really cool things with Marvin. You know, like, they really could have expanded out his lore and stuff compared to, like, all the other characters we had. I I feel that Birkin's wife was kind of, um... I, th I think that Annette Birkin wasn't taken as far as she could have gone as well. It's just really, really strange. You know, like, Resident Evil 2 is a good game. It's quite possibly the best in the series. I personally like, um... I would have to say my Trinity is probably the remake of one the original version for two and then the original version of three the remake of one was just so goddamn good there was no getting past it so these are the shutters that i normally uh close down and stuff because i just on my way back i don't want to deal with a bunch of zombies it'd be wasting a bunch of ammo and stuff and it's just not something i wanted to do i know that the zombies are literally going to be creeping through the west wing hallway but what I have a tendency to do to circumvent that so I never have to fucking deal with them is I just take the entire second story over and it avoids, it avoids all the zombies and stuff and it's really good stuff like that. But um, no, like I said, I, I really enjoy the remake for one quite a bit. It was just so good. Original 2 and Original 3 were really good for me, I feel. Um, ah, here we go. Uh, the fucking dogs. But, um, I actually like the remake for 2 a lot. I don't think I got the full experience with it. So, one thing that I don't really talk about enough for this game, I don't think, is the, um, the music. Oh god, the score is so good. I, um, I went through this phase in my life where I actually collected all the Resident Evil scores, had them imported from Japan on CD. And the one that I listen to the most is Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 1 has a pretty good score too, but Resident Evil 2 is kind of, um, it's kind of like in this league all of its own. So Capcom went ahead and they announced the, um, the remake for 2. It was an instant sell for me because I had been waiting on a remake of 2 for quite some time. And it actually looked really, really good. So, one of the pre-order bonuses, I went ahead and got it on Xbox One. One of the pre-order bonuses for the Deluxe Edition, I do believe, was the soundtrack. 
or it could have been just something that came with the deluxe edition. You know, feel free to correct me on it. Um, but yeah, it was actually really, really nice because basically what it allowed you to do is just the classic soundtrack and you could play it over the remake. And I kind of feel like I ruined the remake to a certain lesser extent because that is the only soundtrack that I listened to on it. I have literally never heard the original soundtrack for the remake. I heard it was really good. You know, like there's a lot of people that liked it, but I just, I really love the original soundtrack for this. It's just so goddamn good. And I just don't ever get tired of listening to it. But yeah, like, I've never turned off the, uh, I've never turned off the uh, the original soundtrack for the remake. It's it's just one of those things, man. Some things are so good that you just don't really want to substitute. I love the uh, I love the save room themes. I just I, I love all the music they did for two. Like they really had their thinking caps on for a lot of it because it was there was some mix-ins from like one. And then they're like they changed it enough for it to be its own thing, which is what we got with two, you know. And I really, really liked it. I like how they use the orchestral pieces and stuff, and I, I like how the um, I like how the soundtrack. I love how well it conveys mood. That's not something we really see in games anymore. Like I never really see. A game with um, a really original, ah uh, yes, here's where I proceed to get my ass whipped. But I never really see a game that has like a soundtrack that sounds really, really original anymore. It actually kind of sounds like very formulaic orchestral music. Which is very, very strange for me. You know, like it feels very, very generic to a certain extent. And I always felt that that was very, very strange in some instances, you know, for me at least. You know, like, most of the time when I play a game these days, if it's like a new game, it just sounds very generic. But with Resident Evil, well, with all of them, really, in games in the uh, 90s in general and early 2000s to a certain lesser extent, they all had, like, these little tiny touches that you would see with the music and stuff and I really just loved that. It was the little touches that really made these soundtracks special. You know, we just don't see it anymore. Like nobody really wants to do anything super new or super original. I find that um, gaming in the current climate that we're in, they're not really so much interested in doing something new or something super meaningful. I find a lot of the time, a lot of the design choices for most games is literally stuff that falls into the play it safe category. You know, so I just, I, I look back at these older soundtracks and, you know, I say to myself, God damn, this is what we had back then. You know, like I listen to it, it still sounds good. I mean, granted, there is a portion of me, I'm sure, that is looking at it and it's just straight nostalgia, so I'm more than willing to bet that that probably has, you know, um, a lot to do with it, but, you know, they still hold up. You know. Ah, uh, here we go, here's Ada. I don't really think Ada was taken as far as... I don't think Ada was taken as far as she could have been taken. It's really weird, she's like an oddball character. I don't think she's a bad character, but she's definitely like an oddball one. You know, like with Leon, they tried to have some life with him, right? So, you know, he has his moments where he's angry, and then he has his moments where, you know, he goes and he sounds very surely and stuff. And the thing with Leon is that his voice actor actually did a really, really good job with him. I, I do believe that the voice actor for him has passed on, which is really, really sad. I can't remember the poor bloke's name, but um, yeah, the um, the voice for Leon has always been really, really nice, and you know, like it, it wasn't too cheesy. Like Resident Evil back in the '90s was known for the amount of cheese it had. You know, one, two, and three all suffer from it. 
you know, to a certain lesser extent, very cheesy, very campy. I think Resident Evil 1 was probably the biggest sufferer of it. And so, when I actually heard Leon talk in Resident Evil 2 for the first time, it just sounded really good. So, we compare that to the rest of the characters, um, and it just kind of feels like they're lacking. Like, the bar with Leon was so damn high that he literally made all the other fucking characters look bad. And I think Ada Wong kind of suffers the worst. I think, well, it's not so much Ada Wong, it's Ada Wong and Ben. You know, like, Ben's lines are just bad. They're just horrible. Especially for a dude that's, like, supposed to be damn near dead. And then with Ada Wong, the reason why she wasn't really... Uh, what is it? The reason why she wasn't really interesting to me, I feel, as a character is because when she talks, um, I can tell that the company... Like, I can tell that Capcom was trying to make it to where she sounds mysterious, but with the way that she speaks and with a lot of her lines, she doesn't really sound mysterious. She just sounds boring, and it's, like, really, really strange, you know? And, like, even moments that are supposed to be, like, really emotional, still pretty fucking boring for the most part. Like, Leon will sound fine, but it, it's just Ada sounds so flat, you know? And it just sounds so weird in that regard. So, when it comes to the characters, it's, it's a clear-cut case of... I don't really remember Ada too much. Like, she doesn't really poke out of my mind too much in the facet of, oh, you know, hey, you know, these are pretty, you know, pretty memorable and stuff. And then we got Ben here. His, uh, his lines are always... Well, not so much his lines. His tone is always kind of hyper elevated almost over the top and then a lot of his lines that he has are uh, very cheesy as well like even when ada is supposed to sound excited she still sounds really flat thinking about it now she sounds flat to the point of um it sounds like it was done for a budget title <laughs> like literally like, it literally sounds like Capcom gave her 50 bucks and was like, right, read this shit of text. You know, and you know, do it in a day and then you know, get the fuck up out of here. You know, it just it sounds really bad. With Ben, it's almost like they try to like, treat him like a hype man to a certain lesser extent, I think. You know, like, they try to give him, like, sort of this arrogance, a little bit of cockiness, and, you know, it just, it, it kind of, I don't know, it just doesn't really work, because with Resident Evil 2, it's supposed to be more of a serious situation, you know? And with the way that everything is set up, it feels like the dialogue for a lot of these characters collides with the overall story and background. Now, Resident Evil 2 didn't really, you know, have much of a story. I mean, it was kind of going with the theme that we had going on in the 90s, which was evil corporation doing CD shit. You know, we had movies doing it. We had games doing it. You know, it was, it was a very popular subject matter. The only thing that Resident Evil did differently was they took the corporation, and instead of just saying, oh, they're doing CD shit, they are like, oh, yeah, by the way, they're making all these monsters, you know. So that's what kind of set Resident Evil apart, well, all of them really, apart from all of the other media at the time. And then we also had a ton of, uh, back in the 90s, we had a bunch of zombie content as well. So we had like a ton of zombie movies, and, and again, Resident Evil kind of set itself apart because it was a clear-cut case of pairing up corporations, having them make zombies and stuff and then uh directly putting characters in harm's way so it was, it was literally uh it was literally right place right time and just unique enough to matter you know and it's when you think about it you know you're kind of like oh wow you know and so many other companies could have done this but it was capcom that got it right Oh yeah, I love to walk, or well, not so much walk, but run across these damn spiders. 
Shooting these fuckers is so hard. I have no idea why I struggle with it so hard. I started running across them because I literally was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna shoot them with the pistol, and I was missing the majority of my shots. It didn't matter if I was pointing down, pointing forward, you know, like it just was not happening for me. And then for some weird ass reason, I was having the same problem with a shotgun as well, and I'm sitting there thinking in the back of my mind, Jesus Christ, this is a shotgun that's supposed to have spread. <laughs> Why is this like this? You know, like I, I thought to myself, damn, this, this really shouldn't be like this. So with the spiders being a chronic raging pain in my ass, I just learned to run past them. Sometimes every now and then I get stuck on one and he decides to tackle me, but for the most part I get past him pretty easily. My name's Leon. I always felt that this uh, next section with Ada was kind of weird. Like, it kind of made sense, but it kind of didn't. So, like, you take into context, right? You can't get through the shutter. Okay, fine. So, you go ahead and you just lift up Ada. You toss her ass through that overhead vent. Kind of weird positioning, but okay, whatever. And it's really weird how they go about doing it because, you know, like, Leon's like, okay, stand on my shoulders and get in that vent. And then, so you go ahead, you send Ada through. And the weird thing about it is you go through this entire section, you, you know, collect all the items, do the puzzles, all the fun stuff. And the weird thing is, is, um, so the entire time you're going through this area, there doesn't appear to be any real way to actually go to actually get out. And it's really obnoxious, and I feel that it's poorly explained because, like, evidently Ada needs, uh, what is it, assistance just getting into the area to begin with. Okay, fine, whatever. And so you would naturally think, you know, since she needs assistance getting into the area, she would probably need assistance getting out. So you go through this entire area, you know, after the dogs are done face-fucking me for everything that I'm worth. So you go through this area, essentially, and the one thing you'll notice for this entire area is there's really no other form of escape. You know, these panels on the bottom you could try to make the argument for. But the main issue is that those are probably utility panels. Those probably lead to, like, wiring and piping and crap. You know, so it wouldn't really make much sense for her to escape through it. And I understand that, you know, it's a game and stuff and ooh, but I find that one of the many issues with Resident Evil in general is there's always like these bullshit scenarios, you know, like these scenarios where it's like, oh, I am trapped in this area, you know, I'm going to investigate, find items for the main character, and then from there I'm going to proceed that I, or I'm going to proceed to say that I will get out on my own. And I always felt that it was like a really odd thing. You know, it's just like some really strange stuff. And then like, you'll see her just pop in later and it's, it's just so silly. It is so silly and so off the wall. I just, I, it, it blows my mind. Like literally, it blows my mind so hard. And then um, another staple of the 90s. Let's how many or let's see how many fucking block puzzles we can do over the course of 10 years. Oh man, PlayStation One games suffered from these damn things so horribly. The uh, we want to show off basic geometry, so let's go ahead and have you push a bunch of fucking cubes around to either bridge a gap to somewhere else, to hold down a switch. Or to, you know, stack them up. That way you can reach a new area. I mean, I... The one thing that I hated more than anything else in the 90s was the insane amount of fucking cube puzzles. 
Holy shit. You know, I actually, it was kind of weird because throughout all the 90s, I hated cube puzzles. But as I was doing, uh, what is it, as I was doing runs for this game and I had to go and, you know, do the puzzle, it kind of felt like I was slipping on a comfy old pair of pants. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, oh man, I, I kind of missed this. I didn't miss it back then, but I was definitely missing it. You know, tonight as I was wrapping up the run and then getting ready to do commentary. So I just, I, I kind of laugh a little bit, I think. You don't really realize how much you miss something until you haven't had it for a while or until it's gone permanently or... I've been kind of, um, I've been thinking about it a lot, actually. The more I play these old games and stuff, I've been thinking about it a hell of a lot. You know, things I used to bitch about as a kid. I remember being all mad, you know, fucking block puzzles, you know, going and pushing these damn things around. Right here. And, you know, yet you go back and you revisit it, and you're like, oh, this ain't so bad. Think fast. We got Ada here, tossing up the, uh, the key. And then, you know, she goes, and she's like, think fast, and then she goes and tosses up the fucking shot shells as well. I would have totally laughed my ass off if she would have just winged that huge ass, uh... That huge ass metal carrier for the shot shells and just knocked Leon out. I would have laughed so hard at that. There's just like some things that I just laugh at in Resident Evil 2. You know, this scene was one of them. It's because I got that thought stuck in the back of my mind, you know. Just winging that thing of shotgun shells, knocking Leon out, you know, just knocking the piss straight out of him. And it just, it, it makes me laugh. You know, it's just like silly little things that just run through my mind from time to time. Oh, man. Yeah, I always thought it was kind of funny how I'd end up with two shotguns. Everybody would be like, you know, instead of wasting handgun rounds, you know, on all the zombies back at Kendo's gun shop, you know, why don't you just wait to go and get it from the star's room? And the thing is... It's kind of like I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. So I like taking the shotgun very early on because it allows me to whoop that liquor's ass. I am not allowed to just run past most liquors, I've noticed. Like, I try to run past most of them, but that one in the beginning hallway, oh Jesus Christ. Um, no, it ain't happening. So what I like to do is, um, I like to clean out all the zombies next to kendo and stuff um i don't know it just it doesn't feel right to just leave them there with them munching on them and then i go and i pick up the shotgun and that gives me an early advantage of taking out the liquor without spamming a bunch of handgun rounds which actually helps me later because i try to only kill things that are absolutely necessary like resident evil 2 has a lot more enemies but it's a lot more stingy with its ammo it wasn't like 3 where there was like all these weapons and stuff and gunpowders. Like it, it wasn't so much of an action game. Oh, speaking of which. Um, it wasn't so much of an um, action game per se. Um, Resident Evil 1, like you could... There, there wasn't like a ton of enemies in Resi 1 until you started getting towards the end. So you could actually build up... Um, you could actually build up pretty good ammo reserves. But with 2, it was kind of like this um, this interesting mix because on one end, there's not really a whole hell of a lot of ammo until later on in the game and stuff. So early on, they like they forced these large groups of zombies on you like right from the beginning too. Like that first street that Leon's in, zombies everywhere. And it's like, okay, no biggie. You can run around them. And then, like, you go through the alleyway, you're kind of stuck killing a couple of zombies. Okay, whatever. And then that third one, you can let them bite you, shove them down, and then you can go and run around the other zombie that's in the back. And then you run across even more zombies that are munching on somebody out front of what looks like a cafe. And you can run through them as well. But there are certain instances in this game where they kind of go off the survival horror path and they kind of treat it like an action game you know they force you to kill a bunch of zombies you know outright more or less 
so I try to stock up on ammo whenever I can. The, the pistol's pretty solid all the way up to the end of the game. I think the Matilda mod for it greatly helps it. You know, and then you can get the shotgun upgrade later. And a lot of people bitched right here because you have that Ingram and then the ammo pouches on top of it. And so I didn't plan on doing a Claire run, like a Claire B run at all. So normally they were like, oh, hey, do you want to leave this for Claire? And initially I thought about it and I was like, nah, fuck that shit. I'm not going to be doing a B run. I'm just going to take both of it. I've already got a B run saved where she can have the Ingram and stuff. But for this run, I was like, you know, I'm going to need every fucking advantage that I can get. I'm just going to take the pouches because I need to haul more shit around. I'm going to take the Ingram because I just want to fuck shit up with it. And it's going to help save me a lot of ammo in the long run. So I just I take both and I leave the room. But yeah, it felt so good to get those liquors cleaned out of the hallway. Oh man, my initial runs. I was trying to leave them there. I was like, I'm not going to touch them. You know, I don't want to waste ammo. I don't want to waste shot, or I don't want to waste shotgun shells. And then eventually I got to the point where they were taking out such huge amounts of my health that I was like, right, you're too much of a fucking pain in my ass to let live, essentially. So I would go and I would mop them up with the shotgun. And then the evolved versions later are just as big a pain in the ass to me. It was just painful. But yeah, it was just, it was a really just kind of a hell of a thing, I think. And then going through this note and getting ready to pick up the mag and stuff and that uh that shutter uh, normally right about here if i don't actually shutter those windows there's a ton of zombies that actually pour through and stuff and um i just didn't want to deal with them so you know we go ahead and we uh we pick up the mag here and then just leave the room and So for this hallway, I just like to keep it all closed off and stuff. You know, it, it saves me around um, in between 20 to 30 rounds because I'm not just like going and killing all the zombies and stuff. So I go through this door and uh, the one thing that I forget is the upper levels of the hallway are now repopulated with stuff. Some of them are liquors, some of them are zombies. So I try really, really hard to actually like make it through these upper layers. You know, and right now I'm on the lower layers and stuff. I completely forget about this zombie, you know, because he's just laying there. And again, I didn't want to waste rounds. So I forgot that he was actually just sleeping. So when I run across and he starts chewing on my leg, I get a little annoyed. And I stomp his head and stuff. And that's pretty much the end of it. But at this point, what it had really boiled down to is I was actually going and running through like all the doors playing clean up getting all the items that i need to wrapping up the rest of the keys just pretty much everything that i needed to do and i was getting ready to uh go off to the sewers do another ada segment i mean there was like a lot of forward thinking i think with resident evil 2 like you kind of have to i feel to do runs with resident evil 2 you have to be thinking ahead like 20 or 30 minutes and it's kind of hard to do because i have the attention span of a goldfish like, with me, if I'm not hardcore, you know, focusing on it, and, you know, like, if, if I'm not focusing super hard on it, I will forget it. I am really horrible in that regard. So, with Resident Evil 2, um, what it had boiled down to is I, I have to literally go and build up to these runs. Like, what'll happen to uh, train my thinking a fair bit, what'll happen is I'll literally sit there and before I start filming, I'll do two runs over the course of, like, a day, you know. The runs will typically take about two and a half hours, and then I have a tendency to do them in the evening and stuff because I'm normally kind of busy during the day, like I'm always working on something. So in the evening, nine times out of ten, when it's past ten, I sit there and I'm like, I'm going to start doing my runs. And then what winds up happening is that I'll do one, one run that's really, really good. 
And then after that, what will happen is I will immediately follow it up with the run that I plan to record. And so I sit there and um, this is pretty much how I do my runs essentially. I have to build up to it. I have to have a certain level of heat for it as well, you know. And it's because I forget things. You know, it's, it's literally one of the worst things ever. I find that I have to do commentary while things are fresh, like while I'm sitting here recording this. Um, I literally have to sit down and say, oh, okay, well, I just did the run. Well, now's a really good time to go and do commentary because if I don't do it right now, I'm going to friggin' forget. And, you know, it's just I'm, I'm really, really bad in that regard, just from top to bottom, just so bad. And so I literally have to do everything while it's fresh. You know, like I'm the kind of person that leaves reminders all over the place, you know, like, did you do this today? Don't forget to do that, you know. Don't forget to talk to so-and-so about this and that, you know, like I'm, I'm really like codependent on leaving notes for myself because if I don't, I'll just fucking forget. That's just how that is. So we're coming up on the sewer pretty soon. I actually really, really, um, I really liked the sewer. I felt that it had, like, really good flow to it. I always felt that the puzzle to get to the sewer, well, it's not even, like, so much a puzzle. I think it's just, like, a multi-key lock. Um, the thing that I didn't really like about it is it didn't make any sense. I mean, granted, a lot of puzzles in Resident Evil and items in Resident Evil don't really make much sense, but... Like, using, uh, essentially chest piece plugs to actually go and open the door was really fucking obnoxious. So, as you can see here, I'm using the entire upper floor to completely circumvent all those zombies. Because I didn't bother to seal up the windows, I know I didn't seal up the windows. And so, what wound up happening, essentially, was I just traversed the entire upper floor, so I didn't have to deal with them. It keeps ammo in my pocket, and it really helps out late game when I know that I'm going to be fighting a bunch of stuff non-stop. And so I continue to go and do these things to uh, make sure that I have ammo at the end. And I am back. Sorry about that. I had to pause the recording for a little bit and go and take care of some people, but I am back. As a consequence, I damn near completely forgot about everything that I was talking about because, well, goldfish memory span. <clears throat> so, where I'm at currently in the run is, ah uh, yes, I took the top hallway to circumvent all of the zombies, and now I am on my way to the sewers. So I didn't really think the sewers were too bad. I think that in all honesty that the melodrama that they tried to do with the sewers just really didn't feel great. I mean, it was kind of heroic what Leon does and stuff, and then, you know, Ada goes off and, you know, she tries to, I guess, go and get answers and follow Annette Birkin and everything else, but it just it kind of felt like there was really no need to have the sewers there. So around this point, I forget yet more stuff. And so I go and I realize that I have forgotten it. And so as an end result, I go back down the stairs again. And, you know, I just, I, I forget things sometimes. You know, just because the run is going like super smooth and stuff, it doesn't mean that I don't make mistakes and such. So I head back and I think the thing that I've forgotten was all of the chest piece plugs. Because I was just tossing them in the chest for like a really long time. I was like, oh, here's a plug. And I would just toss it in there and forget about it. Yeah, I'm missing all of the plugs. Yeah, I remember where I goofed up right here. So the style of gameplay that I tried to do with this run is... Instead of hitting up the box as many times as I could. Because I don't really like hitting up the box. Unless I absolutely have to. I have a tendency that when I get an item, I try to go and use it as fast as I can. I did it with the crank, you know, I, I tried to hold on to the gems for as much as I, uh, well, for as long as I could. And so, you know, I'd like to just, I'll keep my inventory pretty full 
most of the time until I am given the opportunity to actually go and get rid of whatever item it is that I have. You know, I did it with the plugs, I did it with the gems, you know, I did it with the MO disc and all the keys and stuff. Like, that's actually one thing I do like about how Resident Evil does inventory management. A lot of the time, if you're done with an item, instead of just saying, oh, hey, you know, um, we're just going to allow you to keep the item, you know, you're actually flat out told, hey, you know, this item doesn't really have any sort of use anymore. Would you like to discard it? And they've always done a really good job at sitting there and making sure that you know when you're done with a specific item and stuff. So moving into the end of the game here, well, um, about, I want to say, three quarters the way into the um, game, you know, I'm going to be relying on the shotgun a lot. I'm going to be relying on the Ingram a fair bit. And I'm going to be going and also um, relying on the pistol a fair bit. Like, all the weapons in Resident Evil 2 are useful up until you reach the end, you know. Like, I even used the pistol throughout pretty much almost all the end and stuff. Because, yeah, it's a pistol, but with the Matilda add-on for it and stuff, it's actually really, really nice because it gives a burst fire. So, while the pistol may not do much damage to larger enemies when you start having the capability to literally go and um, hose them down in a raw volume. It makes everything, you know, a lot more um, easy to defeat. There was even previous runs that I had done of this game where I was going and fighting the last two bosses with the pistol because the pistol is just so good towards the end, you know, you can just pepper them with it. Get away! So we have been here, and like, this is... Uh, him being infected with a G small body. I used to make the joke here of, oh, you know, no tongue on the first date and stuff. And I think the problem that um, I had with playing Resident Evil 2 is I don't traditionally take horror games very seriously. Like, I know that there's a lot of people that they sit there and they're like, oh, it's a horror game and they'll turn out the lights and they'll get real close to the screen and stuff. And, like, they treat it as a very serious affair. But for me, even though it's a horror game... After a while, I start to make fun of it. You know, like I leech, uh, I leech uh, comedy into it whenever I can. You know, and with Ben, it's like really no different. So with Ben, you know, it's like even though he's been infected and he's got this like little thingy inside of him, you know, he um, he continues to be kind of like an over the top character and. It's really weird because with Resident Evil 2, they tried to take it seriously, but then they have comedic moments like this where you're kind of like, you know, is this guy for real? So he was like another character they could have done so much more with, you know, like in the, um, in the remake, he doesn't really have much of a role either. It's kind of weird because like they could have done some really cool things with him, I think. Like, they could have been like, oh, hey, you know, I'm investigating what's going on in Raccoon City and this is what I found. And, like, they could have literally made him much more of a target, much more of a person of interest instead of just this kind of generic hype man quality that he has. So this scene where the G small body just kind of, like, rips out of him and stuff, the first time I saw that, it had scared the hell out of me. And so I had just, um, when I first saw this scene, I had literally just got through watching Aliens as a kid. And so, like, we were sitting there, we had just finished up watching Aliens on VHS. It was like a really nice Friday night. And we had started playing Resident Evil 2, um, me and my friend James. So we were going, and we had pushed up to this point. And I remember that scene in Aliens just, like, really freaking me out, you know, where um, that guy just lurches back and it just kind of bursts out of him. And it's just, like, a really nasty, just real visceral scene. And so we were like, oh, man, that was some scary stuff. And then we were like, oh, well, we can't sleep, you know, let's play Resident Evil 2, which, you know, really wasn't that much better of an idea. And so this scene hits and it just, it, it floored me. It, it freaked me out so bad. And so sleep just wasn't happening, you know, like we thought that if we played Resident Evil 2 that we would just get bored and stuff and it just wasn't happening. 
So I think um, now that Ada's out of the scene, I think the the way that Ada kind of progresses throughout the game is um, very odd, for lack of a better term. Like, I don't really like how monotone Ada sounds throughout the entire duration of the game. Like, every time she talks, it's like, oh, I'm looking for John. And then it's like, oh, I think John is at the insert, you know, location here. And, like, this is just kind of how she progresses as a character. You know? And it just it feels really boring sometimes. But I'm pretty sure I've already covered Ada Wong already. So I probably shouldn't dwell on it too much. But no, the sewers are actually, like, an okay place and... You know, it's not the, well, it's one of my favorite areas because of, like, I like how smooth it is when it comes to, like, progression and stuff. There's, like, not a lot of backtracking, and it just feels like it really should be. One of the main issues that I've had with Resident Evil for a while is, um, with the original Resident Evil, it didn't really, the backtracking didn't feel horrible because it took place in a mansion. And so you're like, oh, I'm in a mansion. And you literally have, like, all these easy-to-access rooms. Or a room that you could be uh, trying to get to is literally just a floor up. And you can just take a staircase up and get to where you need to be. But with Resident Evil 2 and 3, some of the backtracking feels a little bit excessive. Uh, sometimes it's, like, literally from point A to point B all the way over on the other side of the map. Resident Evil 3 was actually worse in this regard, I feel, because, like, it would make you go from one end of that district in Raccoon City all the way to the other end of another district, and it didn't really feel great. With Resident Evil 2, they tried to, like, loop it around a fair bit, you know, and so they were like, oh, okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and introduce this uh, segment where you have this uh, staircase that kind of drops down where the last chess piece is. And so, you know, they, they introduce that segment very early on. They make it very accessible very early on. And so, like, they kind of tell you, hey, you're going to be coming back here at some point. And so you have to come back a couple of times, you know. But, like, it only does it a handful of times. Like, it doesn't really feel super excessive like Resident Evil 3 does. It's like Resident Evil 1 had a good mix of it. You know, it, it wasn't too long, it wasn't too short, it was just like right there, you know, and it, it didn't ever really feel like it overstayed its welcome. Resident Evil 2 does it a little bit more and it can be somewhat of a nuisance at times. And then Resident Evil 3, they'd be like, oh, well, you're going from point A to point B, and I, I didn't really care for it too much. We kind of saw that less and less with, like, Resident Evil 4 and 5. Like, you would still have to backtrack and stuff, but it wasn't to an insane uh, extent or anything. Like, I know a lot of Resident Evil 4, it would be like, okay, you have this item now, you can go back to the door. But the going back part wasn't really that bad, because a lot of the time they would have you take, like, a separate route, which would be really unique and loaded with enemies. So it's kind of interesting to see how these games have kind of changed, you know, as the decades have gone by and stuff. And more boring dialogue from Ada. But no, it, um, Resident Evil 2, it, like I said, there's some segments where they have you going really, really far. And then there's other segments that are like really short and sweet. I think the big thing that Resident Evil 2 kind of lacks in this regard is consistency. Like, sometimes it's good to keep people guessing and stuff, but other times it's really, really nice to have consistency with the title. And so with Resident Evil, it's like, instead of, like, giving you, given the, uh, the open map nature of the game, most of the time, you know, they're still going to have you going over to the far end of the police department. The, I feel that the labs really aren't that bad in that regard. Because the labs are actually really, really short when you sit there and actually look at them. When you're looking at the labs, it's like that first segment is short and sweet. And then the second segment is really, really long. And then it has you go loop around back to the shorter segment and loop back to the longer segment. And 
it's just really kind of weird how they go and do the progression and stuff and it's why I try to hustle through the labs as fast as I can sometimes. Like I'm not like trying to speedrun it I don't think but I'm definitely trying to go through it faster than normal because after a while it feels kind of monotonous. And then um, the enemies don't really feel particularly um, memorable either. But no, I always thought that it was kind of funny because the, um, like they go and they give you that Ingram there, well, that, uh, that Mac 10 with that huge ass, um, barrel extension with shroud on it. And I always thought it was like kind of funny because as far as I can remember, I think that the ammo that's inside of it is the only ammo you get. And so for a long time when I would go and play this game and I would go and get the Ingram, I would literally be like, oh, you know, I've, I've got to, you know, I've got to find ammo for it, but I was always, you know, never finding it. I'd find ammo for the Magnum and stuff and the shotgun, of course, and always the pistol, but the Ingram just wasn't really something that I would ever find ammo for. So as time had gone on, I had just kind of naturally assumed that the Ingram just never got ammo. So this section with Ada here, with her chasing Annette Birkin, it, um, it doesn't feel too long or too short. You know, it feels just right. Like, that's one thing I actually kind of liked about the Ada sections, is that um, when playing as other characters, typically, in the other games, sometimes they either feel too short or too long. But I found when playing as Annette, it wasn't too long or too short. It was just right. And a lot of the times she would always go and um, have like a piece of drama attached to her sections as well, which is really, really nice. You know, like they would always with um, Ada, they would always at least try to advance something with her. So it was never really felt like that you were going and doing something completely useless. Like even in her first section where you play as her, it's like, oh, well, you're, you're going to be here to like fetch a key and a box of shot shells. And that's pretty much it. How did you know? So as much as I kind of like hate her dialogue, I like what she kind of brings to Resident Evil 2 a little bit. You know, like I like her interactions with Annette a fair bit. I don't really like her um, interactions with Leon because it just sounds so monotone and stuff. Like it, it almost feels like Ada has no personality. I won't let and so it feels really, really weird in that regard with like a lot of her lines and stuff. It's capable of creating the ultimate bio weapon. Its potential is even greater than that of the T virus. Then that must mean the creature in the police department. I always felt that, like, with Annette and stuff, I always felt like they could have done more with her dialogue. They kind of, um. They kind of plagiarize her a little bit as just. A mad scientist that's kind of like upset that her husband's gone and even though her husband's quite literally the main monster of the whole fucking game. And then, you know, they're like, oh, you must be here for the G-Virus sample and everything else. And it feels very formulaic and very stereotypical for uh, media from that era. No one will ever take you away from me. There he is. So you finally come. Doctor, we're here to collect the G virus sample. I think it's really interesting how they actually do these um, little uh, animations for the game and stuff. Like back then, this was considered uh, really, really nice and stuff. And it looks actually really plain by today's standards. And I never really, the, the only thing I never really liked about these animations, it wasn't so much how the animation looked, it was the fact that they compressed the holy living hell out of them to try to fit everything on the disc. And then they were also in like really low resolution on top of it. So even like I found that when playing Resident Evil 2 back on PlayStation, I found even on a really nice like CRT and stuff, I found that the animations were just kind of 
I don't know, like even on an old CRT, they, they still looked pretty low quality and stuff. It was weird how much compression they used on these damn things. And it's like, I understand they're trying to make it fit on two discs and stuff, but I think this is why, like, when I would go and play Resident Evil 2, a lot of the times I would literally sit there and just go and play it as much as I could on GameCube, because GameCube was just cleaned up across the board. And then I also had the, um, I had the added bonus of having a um, GameCube with really nice cords on top of it. It wasn't using standard composites, so things looked a little bit more cleaner, you know, it was just really, really nice, and I, I still think to this day that the GameCube version is arguably the best version. The PlayStation version is always classic, I feel, you know, like, the PlayStation version is known for pioneering, I think, you know, because it was a part of that first wave, but... In all of the reissues that Resident Evil 2 had, I think that the GameCube version was arguably the best because they cleaned up all the signal issues. The, um, what is it, the cutscenes were not compressed all to high hell. I mean, it just, it was a much better port, I think. And I think that kind of counts for, like, all of the Resident Evil titles, you know? Um, I think that personally, like, looking back at all of them and stuff, like, the various ports they had, I think my favorite for Resident Evil 1, strangely enough, was on the Nintendo DS. And the reason why is it had, like, everything from all of the, um, it had everything from all of the other ports. And then it also, the DS version had two modes. You had classic mode if you just wanted to take Resident Evil on the go. And then it also had, um... The, uh, the newer mode that it had where it had like touchscreen based puzzles and stuff and it was actually really really nice to play the only thing that I think that they didn't really innovate too much on was uh, the cutscenes still looked like garbage but to be fair it is running on a Nintendo DS so with Resident Evil 2 it didn't really get as many ports as one but the ports that it did get were all really really nice and then Resident Evil 3, I think, got the least amount of ports. And, like, some of them had other... Some of them had more costumes than others. The GameCube version had cleaned up visuals and its own separate set of costumes and criteria for unlocking things. And there's, like, so many different ports of all these games and stuff, and it's kind of hard to keep track of them all. But it always seems like... It's kind of weird because when you think back on like Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, you never really hear about the other ports too often. You know, like everybody's like, oh, the PlayStation ports were the best. And like, they, I feel that they kind of view them through rose tinted glasses a little mm -hmm. bit. I personally love the GameCube versions the most because, like I said, everything's cleaned up and stuff. And Resident Evil 1 was really nice on the DS as well. And it's just really interesting. But I think that when you go back and you look at these titles and stuff, the reason why people love them so much is because it has that classic PlayStation 1 aesthetic. You know, and like, it's it's a very iconic thing, I think. Like, when you look at all PlayStation 1 games, they all have that early 3D aesthetic and stuff where things are kind of rough and then you got the huge amounts of dithering and you know it's just it's something you recognize very very easily and so I think people kind of fall in love with it a little bit you know like they kind of sit there and they get so used to seeing it that it almost like when you experience the game without it it looks kind of weird to a certain extent So I think that's one of the things that, you know, like I like all the ports for all the Resident Evil titles. For two, GameCube is my favorite, but the PlayStation 1 version is nice as well because it does have that aesthetic. Strangely enough, uh, playing it on the GameCube as well, the music sounds better. So I think that it may not be as compressed on the cube as well. But no, it was just, um, it was really nice to go back and revisit this title, I think. I kind of like how they did water effects on this game and everything else. I mean, it was pretty cool for the time. I really enjoyed it.
And then, of course, you have, like, this little bridge puzzle here. I wouldn't even go as far as to call it a bridge. You just got to make sure if it's in the, uh, you got to make sure if it's in the right position. So, but I kind of hated this section a little bit for how it handles item management and stuff because they kind of force you, for the sake of getting things done, they kind of force you to carry, like, all these things between various medallions and then the, um, the turn crank and everything else. It just didn't really feel super amazing and stuff and then they have you fighting quite a few enemies as well as you're pushing through and then you know you're off to the next area So I loved this fight quite a bit. I The first time I beat this fight in this particular method, I kind of shit my pants a little bit because I thought that I was going to be fighting this dude with like tons of ammo and everything else. And some things as time has gone on, I uh, remember quite easily. Like I don't remember all of Resident Evil 2 very easily, but this fight definitely pokes out in my mind, you know, and... It just, it was a really, really lovely fight. It was scary as hell, too, because it's like this giant, you know, mutated um, alligator, crocodile, whatever the hell you want to call it, you know, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, man, I'm going to have to fight this, and this is scary as hell because it's a big creature in a confined space. So it was actually my older brother that had actually taught me about this trick, and I was young and ignorant. Oh, so, there you go. Boom, just straight up blew his mind literally and you only do it with a couple of bullets and looking back at like how the gator looks now it's just so silly because the uh, the graphics are so um dated so like the top of his head is just gone and you know it's you got this you got this smooth texture area where it used to be attached and stuff and it's just really silly i think But yeah, I just, I thought it was kind of funny because looking back on it, there's only really two bosses that they seriously make you work for. Most of the bosses in Resident Evil 2 are very, um, I wouldn't so much call them easy. They're very basic in what you have to do to, to, uh, to defeat them and such. Uh, even on the harder difficulties, they're still pretty basic, you know, so it's like with the, um, with the G-Body, it's real easy. It's just a DPS race. And then with the uh, the Croc, again, very easy. Just wait for him to swallow a cylinder. Well, get the cylinder in his mouth, then you go shoot it. Kill him. You know, rinse, dry, repeat if needed. You know, it's just one of those things, I think. And the only bosses that really kind of gave me a run for my money on the harder difficulties was literally fighting G at the end. Like, all of the... Um, iterations of G were always pretty brutal especially once he starts picking up speed when he's like skittering around on all fours and stuff and like it, it still gives me a run for my money to this day like I tried to actually do a um a standard run and I was like oh god this guy's still a pain in my ass all these years later so it was just really one of those things and I kind of like the difficulty, though. You know, like, I like sitting down and being like, yeah, I whipped his ass and it feels good, you know. It um, it gives you that sense of accomplishment. And I think Resident Evil's always been really good like that. I don't think um, any of the Resident Evil games literally thinking about it now in terms of bosses and stuff. I don't ever remember any boss where I sat there and I fought it. And it just kind of felt like the boss laid down and did nothing. Like, even the um, fighting the gator down here, you know, you would still have to experiment and figure out that the gator can actually go and put cylinders in his mouth and stuff. So there's like this certain level of uh, trial and error, I guess. But yeah, there was never really any titles, or any titles, sorry, um, any bosses in any of the titles where I kind of sat down and I was like, you know, that really wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be.
always thought it was like, um, I always thought it was kind of funny how Leon has like this bullet wound in him essentially. And so what happens is even though he's, uh, technically speaking, um, wounded all to high health, he still goes and he like manhandles like all these, uh, what is it? All these, uh, cranks and stuff. I always thought that that was just funny as hell because I would sit there and I would think about it. It's like, man, if I sat there and I took like a bullet through my shoulder and stuff, I definitely would not want to be cranking anything like at all. It just, it would not be happening. There would be no way in hell I would be like, yeah, I've got a hole through my shoulder. Let's go ahead and just crank each and every little thing. It just would not be happening. God, that poor spider tried so hard. For some reason, whenever I pass through this tunnel, it really reminds me of the mine area from Resident Evil 1. Like, even this upcoming area right here, it reminds me of the um, the elevator from Resi 1 a fair bit, and I always thought it was kind of strange. In my mind's eye, it kind of felt like it was a reused asset to a certain extent, although I'm pretty sure it most likely wasn't. You know, it just it always gave me that vibe walking through it. So the one thing that I always kind of laughed at a little bit with Resident Evil 2 in these later sequences is when uh, G's attacking and stuff, I think they do a pretty good job of scripting most of it. Like, they give you a good amount of time to get the hell out of the way. You know, they do the whole uh, dust dropping from the top of a metal ceiling effect, which I always thought was kind of strange. You know, it's like, oh yes, look at this dirt, you know, just casually pop off of this metal ceiling here and but the thing that always like really kind of struck me in all of these uh, train car segments is how often Ada gets knocked the fuck out. I always thought it was a really funny thing because I know that it's supposed to be like a serious scene where it's like, oh, Ada's wounded. But it seems like every time she gets in one of these damn trains, she gets knocked out. And half the time the knockout doesn't even make sense. You know, because like you got this monster with these just huge ass fucking uh, machete fingers just going and plowing through the sides and the top and everything else and you would seriously think she would either be impaled or critically wounded or you know something but instead she just gets knocked out you know i just i always thought it was really really funny it was just really laughable to me and so i forgot uh, another thing here you know as you can see i'm sitting here lighting the uh, the flare and the first time I had found this, I thought it was part of the game. I didn't realize that there was an item right there. So what this is, is it's basically a weapon locker key. And we get to take it deep into the labs and it opens up a locker that has the, um, the weapon parts for the Magnum. That I'm not actually really sure what the weapons part, weapon parts do. I think it just gives the Magnum more power and that's it. Because it fires slow, it's it's heavier. I don't think it gets more um, ammo in the... Um, I don't think it gets more ammo in the magazine. You know, so I'm pretty sure it's just a damage mod. So we're on our way to the end of the game. And I actually... Um, I wasn't even sure if I was going to grab these parts. And so these, what we're getting ready to pick up is the, well, what is it, the shotgun parts. And so what it does is it basically kind of turns it into a, um, oh, what is it, a, a Remington 870 police special, I believe. I could be wrong, don't quote me on it, that's just what it looks like. And it was really strange because, um, so Leon is supposed to be like a new rookie cop and stuff. And so you would seriously think that as a police officer, he would have some sort of level of firearms training. And so the thing that I always felt was pretty funny about the shotgun upgrade is it does a truck ton of damage. 
and I guess at some point they were trying to balance the weapon. And so, as an end result, you don't, as far as I can tell, you don't pump it. But every single time you fire it, it's like, it's almost like it's getting ready to throw Leon back on his ass. So he has, like, this shotgun and stuff with all this power, and it can cut zombies in half. Like, it's so damn strong that if you literally go point the shotgun up, pining for a headshot, right? If you point it up, instead of taking the head off, it'll take off the entire upper torso. Like, they will be missing their head and their arms. And so I always thought it was, like, kind of funny, you know, because Leon is supposed to be this trained officer of the law that's, you know, on his first day and stuff, yada, yada, yada. And yet he's got this uh, standard shotgun that, strangely enough, most police forces actually used. And every time he fires it, it damn near puts him on his ass. So I think personally they were just, like I said, I think they were just trying to balance it a fair bit. And they were like, oh, okay, well, you know, it's going to hold more ammo. It's going to do more damage. You know, we're just going to make it this bestial weapon and stuff. And it's one of the reasons why I use it so much at the end of the game, because whatever the hell it hits more or less dies with the exception being some of the plant monsters occasionally and of course the um the evolved liquors you know like the liquors they'll typically if you hit them center mass they typically die from two shells the zombies die from one shell like you can even be sort of far away tag them with it and they still die from a single shell but yeah i wish um it's really weird because it feels like um, all of these weapon upgrades just hit at the end of the game, short of the uh, the Matilda mod. And so I kind of wish, with Resident Evil 2, I kind of wish that the mods were like more spread out. I mean, it's cool that they do the mods, right? But I wish that they were more spread out a bit. Like have like one in the upper area of the police station and then have one in like the following area just kind of spread it out a little bit you know give us something to hunt around like it feels really weird when you're coming up on the end of the game and they start giving you like mod after mod it's like oh hey here's the shotgun mod oh yeah hey here's the uh here's the mag mod and you know it just it feels like a lot at one given point in time and so I think that it was actually really, really nice because the remake actually remedies this a fair bit with its mods. Like, they're more spread out and stuff. And they make you kind of, um, with Resident Evil uh, 2 Classic, basically, um, with the pistol mod, you have to go and you kind of have to hunt around for it. You can actually miss it very easily if you don't use that small key on that little tiny side table. And then you can easily miss the mag mod. Um, I think the only reason when I was younger, uh, that I even found the shotgun mod is, you know, there she goes, getting knocked out again. But, um, the only reason that I even found the, uh, what is it, the shotgun mod is because every dead body that I run across, I have a tendency to check. And, you know, most of the time they, uh, they have nothing, but sometimes they have something and that's where the shotgun mod came from. So this upcoming boss fight I didn't really care for too much. The only thing I enjoyed about it was watching the transformation. The one thing that I liked about G the most, compared to all other monsters, even Nemesis, is it starts off as like a normal man. And then as the game goes on, you get to watch it mutate to the point where you get to watch the humanity of the character literally vanish. Especially, like, regarding the face and stuff, and you literally get to see um, all of it mutate very heavily. And then with G, another cool thing about it is there is this um, eye theme going on with it a fair bit, where there's eyeballs all over the place. I thought it was kind of interesting how when they went to go and do the remake, how they just kind of sat there and they made the all of the eyes on G, like, kind of like a mandatory weak point. But... In the original game, I just really love how they go about just having them mutate very, very heavily. It kind of feels like the inspiration for Nemesis a little bit in Resident Evil 3. 
because I noticed that as the games went on, mutations of, uh, well, consistent and constant mutations for later uh, bosses became more and more of a thing. Like, we had mutations in the first title, especially with, um, what is it? Especially with Nemesis a fair bit. Like, you know, we have, or not Nemesis, sorry, the, uh, the Tyrant. So, um, the Tyrant actually had, like, his souped-up mode and stuff, but it wasn't, like, really a super heavy mutation or anything. But with G, it's like he starts off as a, a mutated dude with, like, a mutated arm, but he still looks pretty human. And then, you know, you have where his face kind of migrates to the center of his body and stuff, and he sprouts, like, additional arms. And, you know, G actually has a really interesting, um... He has a very interesting path with his mutations, I think. With Nemesis, I don't think the Nemesis's mutations were as creative as G's. Like, G's is mostly like a profound change. With Nemesis, you meet him the first time in his trench coat, you go, you take him out, then he pops up, he's got his arm wrapped up, and he's got a rocket launcher. You take him out, and then, like, after that, you know, he kind of... Uh, sprouts all these tentacles from his right arm and stuff and then you go and you take that out and um, then he kind of like loses his tentacles and he's just got like a single big one that is very reminiscent from the first fight of the game like he just doesn't really I don't really feel like he does anything super new until the end of the game when he turns into that creature with like the beak and stuff and all the tentacles and but I think that's what kind of makes G stand out uh, very well in Resident Evil 2, is his evolution is actually really, really nice. You know, that's one thing I liked about the G virus in general, is how much it mutated and stuff. And I think that's why, like, even though I love Resident Evil 3 for what it is, I feel that Resident Evil 2 is still a superior game in some aspects, like it has better creature design it has better music i feel the only thing that resident evil 3 did better was it tried to have it tried to break up the monotony with the zombies and what i mean by that is in resident evil 2 when you play it um they use the same zombie type over and over so it's either like a naked zombie or like a, a zombie in a t-shirt in resident evil 3 they tried to do uh some things differently you know they tried to break it up more which i can respect but Resident Evil 2, you know, it's a very enjoyable game. You know, it does so much stuff right and very little wrong. And I feel like every time I go back and I play this game, like, most of my criticisms of it are literally just me nitpicking. So we're literally heading into, like, the, um, the ass end of the game, and so I'm, like, I'm taking some time to actually prepare here. I was kind of, in many ways, kind of paying attention, kind of not paying attention to the run. I had a bunch of people that were, like, trying to message me and stuff at the time, so I was sitting here, and even though that I announced I'm doing the run and that I kind of, you know, need to be left the hell alone, I would still get people that would message me and stuff, and so my uh, ringtone is literally the check map sound effect from Silent Hill 2. And so it catches my ear every time somebody would actually go and message me. So I would literally turn my head and nine times out of ten I would be getting nailed by something. So for this segment it's like you see me going back a lot of the time and getting more health items and stuff because I'm simply just not paying attention adequately enough. And so in the previous area, you saw me, like, checking the door for the elevator and stuff. I kind of like that descriptive text a fair bit. Like, I'll be fully aware that it doesn't lead anywhere. But sometimes I just like walking up and clicking on it just to see what it says. I do it with a lot of items and various things around the entire game and stuff. And I find that, like, when I do these runs, I gotta kind of refrain from it a fair bit because... I literally sit down and it's like, you know, rain, they don't want to sit here and watch this, you know, and, but I do enjoy it. It makes me wonder sometimes if there was just like a person on the dev team who their entire job was to literally go through and give everything descriptive text. 
I, I would have loved to see the creation process for that. Unfortunately, like with Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3, there's not really a lot of making ofs. It just wasn't really like a, um, it wasn't a common thing back then, I don't think. Like, I don't really remember any studios literally sitting here going, okay, we're going to be releasing the making of of the game, you know, and it's just kind of sad because I would have loved to see a lot of the, um, a lot of the processes behind a lot of these things and stuff and a lot of these pieces of design. I would have loved to hear how they did it. Every now and then you hear something, you know, like I know with, um, the Resident Evils, like the early games, they were talking about how long it took to uh, render these backgrounds that the character would walk on, and they'd be like, yeah, sometimes it would be like an overnight process. But I think that as a fan, I would have loved to just see more of like the overall uh, process for like character, de character design, story development, things like that. And so you never really see it. Like, uh, the only horror franchise where I've actually seen a really good making of was, weirdly enough, Silent Hill. They had making ofs for Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3, and all of them were really good. And I really, really wish that Resident Evil would have gotten the same attention. So with this zombie that I just threw to the ground, I, um, for some reason these zombies always catch me. And I don't know why. I think it's literally because I just enter the room and I'm not expecting it there for whatever reason. But every time I had done a run and entered this particular hallway, I, I always get nailed by these guys and I hate it. You know, I like I try to avoid it <laughs> when I can remember it, but I'm not always good at it. So the only thing that really aggravated me about this shotgun and it's the only nitpick I have for it aside from the insane amount of recoil. Is sometimes I would have to waste additional ammo. And what I mean by that is if I shoot a zombie center mass with it, sometimes it doesn't kill them. Sometimes it just cuts them in half. And I wasn't really like a super huge fan of that. Like I was kind of used to the shotguns from all the other games where they just, you know, hit things, they die, and that's pretty much the end of it. But with Resident Evil 2, I find that you have to have a little bit of patience for the upgraded shotgun because sometimes it cuts them in half. Um, sometimes it'll... I don't know if it's a glitch, but sometimes if you hit them center mass, their head pops off. And they're still alive. So I'm assuming it's a glitch. But the, the enhanced shotgun, it does like all kinds of weird shit that it probably shouldn't be doing. Sometimes headshots with it don't work. Like anybody that's used any of the shotguns in any of the classic games, you know, they're probably used to pointing up, letting the zombie get close, then squeezing the trigger to just make their head pop. And sometimes with this shotgun, it doesn't do it. Like it's, I find that this shotgun is very hit and miss. So the main issue is like, I'm literally sitting here and um, I'm trying to take off their heads, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I hated these, uh, I hated these plant creatures that were coming up on with a cold just miserable kind of passion a little bit um i didn't like the plant creature in the vent i sure as hell didn't like the plant creatures that were standing up in the hall i just i felt that they were kind of like the asshole enemy of the game a fair bit because you know if you get close to them they hug you and they do tons of damage if you're far away trying to stay the hell away from them they just spit acid on you i mean they're just kind of like the ultimate fuck you enemy they're almost as bad as the dogs to a certain extent. Like, I never thought I'd hear myself say that, but they're actually more aggravating than the dogs. And I just, I really didn't care for it too much. So this plant hanging out of the wall here, I've always, every time I get a chance to light this damn thing up, I, I always do it. 
I mean, I don't technically need what's in this room. I just like burning this asshole so he doesn't slap me anymore. You know, and it's like you go, you light him on fire, and then the sprinkler system kicks on. So, we go, we crawl through the vent. And then right on the other side, we've got, you know, uh, we've got these two assholes right here. And I, I really love this shotgun just for how easily it mops both of them up. It is just such a solid weapon. I just really, I just really, really wish that Leon didn't struggle with it as hard as he does. You know, like he's kind of just sitting there and he's like, oh God, I squeezed out his shell. Oh, yeah, I need five seconds to, you know, pop my wrist back into orbit. It's like, ugh. But no, I, th I think it's kind of great how they reward exploring a fair bit in the later areas with extra ammo and stuff because... I think the um, the team knew that you were going to need it to a certain extent, you know, playing it on the harder difficulties and such, and... Ah, yes, here they are. God, I hated these damn things. So, I decided that... Ah, there's the acid. I decided that I was going to take him out with the pistol. And at this point, like, I fully realized that there is, um... There's nothing for me to use my pistol on. Aside from that. So I look at my ammo count. I'm like, you know what? I know that I've got enough shot shells to get to the end of the game. I know that I'm going to have enough mag rounds for the end of the game. The only thing that I really just could never get past without some form of malice is even when they're dead, they can still attack you. Like I said, they're the ultimate in fuck you technology straight from fucking Capcom. You know, it's like, we will not only whoop your ass up close, we will whoop it far away. And just when you think it is over, we will whoop your ass even while we're dead. And I just, I really hated that about the fucking plants. So this is where I start to go and get healing items all the time. Because my phone at the time was just going off. And I, like, the weird thing is, is like I was actually waiting for a specific message from somebody. So the entire time this shit was going off, I had literally sat there and I was trying to play the game, you know, and then check the phone because like I'm, I'm looking for something in specific. And so I'm literally getting my ass whipped the entire duration of the end of the game because I just was looking and looking and looking and hindsight, I probably should have done the recording on a different night. But, like I had stated earlier, you know, it's like I'll get a couple of runs in me. And then I'll be like, man, I've got all this fresh knowledge and stuff. And so I'll go and I'll do the run that's recorded, you know, because I have all that fresh knowledge. And it's just kind of, um, it's a habit. You know, it's, it's definitely a habit. So, uh, yep, yeah, it takes about two shells to put them down. So... The only real discrepancy, the, the only real thing that I hated about the AB system that they did for this game is they had you take separate paths, but it wasn't so much the separate paths that were an issue. The main issue that I had is even though you were taking like, say, a path, right? What would wind up happening is you would literally sit there and you would run across all these items for B path as well especially in the labs the labs arguably do it the worst and it was really really weird and stuff because i'm sitting there and you know like i understand that they're trying to make the entire map versatile enough to do a and b runs and then have different characters and just like all this stuff you know but i really wish that they could have tailored it a little bit better for the run that you were doing like, so the holes where Sherry would walk through, those make sense. You know, those definitely make sense. But the thing that was really fucking with me, I think, the entire time I was in the labs, aside from these assholes right here, is that, um, what was going on, essentially, 
was that I was running across a bunch of items that would typically be used for the B scenario, more specifically for the escape sequence. So you have the extra door where you need like additional um, additional people to like help you with it and blah blah blah. And I just I really wish that they would have edited that out a little bit more. You know, like maybe instead of whoa, holy shit, I forgot about him. But um, put him down, lay on. There we go. But so, oh Jesus Christ, he's still there. Just fucking die already. But um. Oh. It was really weird, like, I think what they could have done with the game, I don't really know how, would it, how it would have affected the game's size, I'm assuming probably not too much. But instead of having that shutter lift and having that door behind it, they could have just said some cheesy shit, like, um, oh, the door is broken, or blah 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 blah, you know. So it's one of the few times where the descriptive text actually works against the game a little bit, and... It was cool what they wanted to do with Resident Evil 2. I'm not going to knock it. They were trying to give it insane amounts of replay value, which they did. They didn't fail with it. It's just it felt like that some of it was sloppily done. Like, seriously. With Resident Evil 1, we don't have this issue because there's no AB system. Um, same thing with 3. As far as I can tell, there's no like multi-character AB system. So the map is still pretty formulaic, but 3 has its own issues as well because of the randomized puzzles and everything else. So we're using this key on the weapon locker to go ahead and get the magnum parts. I did a um, goof there. Sometimes my brain gets confused and I'm like, do I need to use this item here? So there we go. Shreds off that entire top half. God, I love this thing. And then my aim was screwing up there for a little bit. Shotgun so strong it throws his ass back into the previous frame. Jeez. I hate to admit it, it kind of makes Leon look bad to a certain extent. Like, it makes me kind of wonder if all the other police officers would have survived if he would have gone to training for this damn thing. How hard would they have laughed at him? Like, ah, oh, yes. Go look at Mr. Kennedy and watch him get manhandled by that 870. You know, they all just line up and watch him. Oh, man, that would have been the worst. So there's really not much to say for the rest of this ending segment here. I know we got about what looks like 18 minutes left on the clock. The other room that I passed has a giant fucking moth in it. And to be fair, for this particular run, that room literally does nothing. So I have a tendency to pass it up. Like, that whole room in general is just really miserable. And so I try to pass it up whenever I can. Like, it's got a giant moth in there, and then it's got, like, all the moths, little kids hogging it up on a goddamn computer that you're supposed to be operating and it's just aggravating so the magnum is done at this point i think for this run i didn't have any additional rounds because i chose to use the magnum earlier than expected so the game plan was literally to start stocking up on a bunch of healing supplies and various other things i would need and you know i'm literally bulking up for the end of the game per se i'm like okay I'm going to have a bunch of enemies that I'm going to have to outrun. And then I'm going to have to deal with a bunch of, uh, well, not so much a bunch of bosses, but, you know, a multi-stage boss and everything else. And, you know, so it's like, okay, I'm already here. You know, this is what I'm working towards and everything else. And so I realize at this point I've got herbs coming up. So, like, the injury is not really you know, too horrible or anything. I can literally just sit there and say, okay, well, there's herbs here. I could take it. And if I'm still in critical condition, I can sit there and, um, you know, take another one. So. But I feel that I was, like, starting to get sloppy towards the end to a certain lesser extent. I was sitting there and I was kind of looking at the clock a little bit. I try to keep these videos a little bit on the shorter side for the sake of size because these videos get pretty goddamn big. I know when I was going in doing the other, um, what is it, 
going and doing the other Let's Play of like Donkey Kong Country 3, it wound up being a 25 gig file. And it was like a three and a half hour long movie. And so after I saw that size, I was realizing that it was taking me quite literally forever to upload it. Because my upload's not the best. It's only around, um, it's like 10 megs on a good day, 5 megs on a bad day. So it definitely takes a minute, you know. But I've been incredibly blessed with a lot of these Resident Evil titles that I've been filming and stuff. Because the cool thing about it is since the, uh, what is it, since the background is static, it's not as much data. And so a movie that should be like three and a half, uh, a three and a half hour long movie that should be like 25 gigs and it ends up being like nine or 10 gigs, which was actually really, really nice. It was very surprising and stuff. It was also faster to encode, which was really nice. I and mean, there's just all sorts of benefits and stuff. Got to this thing. Yeah, at this point, I had, uh, truth be told, I had no idea why the hell I was carrying the Ingram on me. I think I was mainly using it as a backup for the bosses that were coming up. Well, the boss that was coming up. So I had, um, I had a weird issue with the previous run before this. I had the mag on me, and typically the boss goes down in a couple of hits. And for some reason, the mag just wasn't doing it. Like, I don't know if it just wasn't registering or what, so I almost wound up dying to it. Oh god, here's a net. Jesus. She's so angry. Her and her fucking supervillain monologue bullshit. Then Leon just really just does not give a fuck. sent here by the agency. The only reason why she came here is to obtain the G-Virus. That's a lie. No, it's I always felt these lengthy exchanges were just really melodramatic. She specifically got close to John and became his girlfriend to get information about Umbrella. Then Leon's just talking with his hands 24-7. I know her. I kind of like that about these older games, like they couldn't do facial animation, so they just talked with their hands a lot more. I have no idea why, but that just cracks me up how she's just standing there and then bam, that pipe just comes down and nails her ass to the floor. It's not even so much what happened, I think, that makes it funny, it's just like how cartoonish it is. Because she's, like, going and, like, giving out this epic, you know, monologue and arguing with Leon to a certain extent and just out of nowhere. It's like the universe just said, bitch, shut up and nailed her ass with a pipe. I just, I, I couldn't really get past it. It just cracks me up so much. I just, I, I laughed at it too hard, like... Every time I'd see it, the only thing that would play in the back of my mind was DOINK! And that's pretty much it. So we're literally at the end of the game here. So I actually... I prefer, strangely enough, the ending sequence for the B run. For Leon, I like the boss at the end of it a little bit more. Like, I don't like the B run in general. I just think that the ending sequence for it is a lot stronger. And it gives a much better ending. Unfortunately, like, for this recording, I didn't want to do a B run. Because you actually have to go and... Um, just to get to the B run, I would have to go do A run as Claire so I can get B run as Leon. And I'd have to do quite a few extra runs just to get those segments that I wanted and I just really didn't care for it too much. Then Ada keeps coming back like a New York cockroach. Like just when you think she's dead she just keeps coming back. Injured? Not a problem. Keeps coming back. It's just really weird how 
they go and like towards the end of the game it's like this uh, massive dump of info and drama and it's really weird because I felt like during the entire like previous three-fourths of the game they don't really do much to actually go and advance it much weirdly enough like they give you the bare minimum don't make me shoot you. And then towards the end of the game, it's all this extra drama. Like, they try really hard to keep the drama going and stuff, and... It's really weird how they try to, um... Kind of weasel in a little bit of a romance factor as well. Which I thought was very odd. Don't give up. It's kind of weird because, like, you go and you look at it. And so you got, like, Ada and Leon, right? And it's like, oh, we're going through this incredibly chaotic event. And then all of a sudden, like, halfway through the game, you know, Ada's like, oh, fuck, John, I've got Leon now. And I just thought it was really, really funny to a certain extent how, um, how that switch flips, essentially. You know, because she's like, I'm looking for my boyfriend, John. And then with Leon, it's like she sends him all these mixed signals. You know, it's like, oh, you're good, you're bad. Oh, I, I want to shoot you to, to get the virus. And then she gets shot. And then, you know, you can see her dropping there. And Leon's having his Darth Vader no moment. It's, it's just so cheesy, man. Like, the way they tried to advance it was just very strange. Like, I understand this was, like, early 3D gaming and stuff, but damn, son. And then, of course, you know, Leon knows what he has in his hand, right? And he's like, fuck this damn thing, and chucks it. <laughs> you know? Like it's, it's just, like, one of those things, you know? Like, if you knew, like, that was a virus in your fucking hand, right? Why the hell would you throw it into a shaft where that vial could possibly break and spread and cause more horrific mutations? Like, it's already bad enough that we got the T-Virus, like, going and making zombies and killer crows and fucking killer dogs and shit. But why the hell would you take a G-Virus sample, wing it out there, and then, you know, think that that would be a proper course of action. Like, if I had a virus sample like that in my possession, I would not be keeping it anywhere near anything where it could shatter. Because I'm already dealing with zombies and shit. I don't want to deal with mutated monsters on top of them, okay? Like, I don't want more Birkins walking around, you know? I know somebody's gonna be like, but, you know, Birkin was a direct injection of the G-Virus. I don't give a shit. I don't care if it's, like, direct injection. I don't give a crap if it's, like, any sort of, like, air infection. You know? I don't give a crap if they, like, mutate better than Birkin, worse than Birkin. It's just not something I would want to deal with. Like, I wouldn't want to be sitting on a train, right? And then being like, oh, man. That would totally suck if this was to just magically shatter. I would have to deal with zombies and mutant freaks of nature. It just, it wouldn't really be that great. So, I never really understood why the hell, you know, they always give you a time limit for this. It's so weird. Even on the harder difficulties and shit, you know, you don't really need five minutes to do this. You just don't. I feel like they kind of over-deliver to a certain lesser extent with the uh, the clock and stuff. So. And here's G with multiple arms and a mouth in his chest. I always thought it was funny as hell because I go, uh, what is it, I go and I pop him twice and he's like, oh, nope, this ain't good enough. And then every time I would see him mutate, the only thing I would think of in the back of my mind is, and this isn't even my final form. And then, you know, he proceeds to grow a garbage disposal in the front of his body and stuff. And I remember, like, being a preteen and fucking watching this shit and being like, Oh, Jesus Christ, this is scary as hell. And 
But looking back on it now, it's just like really weird because he's not really that threatening. The only thing he does is try to stuff you in his mouth, like you see here, sling you all over the place, and that's pretty much it. You know, aside from the damage it causes, he's really just not that scary of a fucking monster. So I get lazy with it and I just decide to DPS race him with the mag and stuff. And But that puts G down for good, at least on this run. And I just, I, I really like how he's evolved throughout the entire duration of the game and stuff. And everything always feels really unique and stuff. By the time he's done evolving, there's like no trace of humanity left in him. The face is gone, the hair is gone, all the human skin is gone. You know, like he finishes transitioning over to just this incredibly wicked looking bestial monster and I appreciate it for what it is. I kind of wish they would have done that with 3. Instead of turning him into a uh, legless chicken with tentacles at the end. So, here we are at the end of the game. So, it's kind of funny because, like, there was differences between the, uh, the GameCube and the PlayStation versions. The GameCube version, when you actually go and do the A run, it flat out tells you that this is not the actual ending. And then, like, it literally, it's kind of interesting because it shows you the back of that cart, and then it highlights the entire door in red... And then it tells you to go back and do it again. Like, they were very kind of tongue-in-cheek, I think, with the uh, the GC port a little bit. With the, uh, with the PlayStation version, like, they don't even let you know that there's B-runs until you go to save. <laughs> when you save, it'll be like Claire B or Leon B, you know? And so it's very interesting how they handled it. I think that the GameCube version was a lot more intuitive with how it handled things as well, strangely enough. Goodbye. And there we go. There's the credits. So, final thoughts coming up on the uh, the grading screen. I actually kind of like how they did the grading for uh, the remake better, strangely enough. Uh, with the remake, you had like all these different modes, but you could actually get S on all those modes, depending on how well you did. For this one, they didn't grade each mode independently, strangely enough. Like, they didn't do normal and easy differently. What they did is they just had like a single grade that you could get and they would actually dock the hell out of you depending on what you did. So even if I go and play this game fast as hell and beat it like in an hour and a half, two hours and do it with zero saves and everything else, the max I can only get is B. So if I wanted to go and get like a higher rank and get unlockables and stuff, I would have to play it on normal, which is fine. It doesn't bother me. But I think that the remake did it better a little bit because they were like, oh, okay, well, we're going to show you this, in this entire fucking chart that's going to have grades for all the difficulties you ran. And I just, I liked it more, you know, because it felt like once you got S on one difficulty, you could literally go and strive to get S on another difficulty, like a higher one. So the remake feels like it actually does progression a little bit better, which I'm a real huge fan of. But no, that's quite literally just Resident Evil 2. No bells, no whistles, pixelated credits, all the fun stuff. So I am sorry a little bit for the condition of this particular um, commentary. Normally I do my commentaries in a single smooth take, but the morning's been a little bit chaotic, so with the recording, it's been like pause, resume, pause, resume. So it's going to be a little bit choppy, and I'm sorry for that. But no, um, I hope that in the future I have the opportunity to do more of these. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'd like to do some Disney games, maybe Resident Evil 1, but for now, I don't really know. Um, with the future being uncertain, 
I don't really know what I'm going to be doing, what I'm not going to be doing. Just, you know, I, I don't really know if I'm coming or going. But for those that actually stuck around for all of the chaos that was this commentary, I greatly appreciate it. I love having you guys here. I hope that you guys enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed making it. Yep, there we go. Two hours, 30 minutes. But yeah, that pretty much concludes the commentary for Resident Evil 2. Um, thank you guys for being here. Till next time.